Okay, good morning. Welcome to the 27th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. And could I please ask everyone present to turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices. We have received apologies this morning from Malcolm Chisholm and indeed from Jean Urquhart. So there will only be five members of the committee today, which will allow a lot more uh, flexibility for members in terms of asking questions of our distinguished uh, guests. Uh, our first item of business this morning is to take evidence on further fiscal devolution from Professor uh, David Heald, University of Aberdeen, Professor John Kay, London School of Economics, and Professor Ronald MacDonald, University of Glasgow. Um, now, I have been informed that Professor Kay needs to catch a train from Waverley at 11.28, so we'll aim to conclude this session by around 11am to allow him to get to the station on time. Professor Kay. Uh, now, all members have received papers from each of our witnesses, so we're going to go straight to questions uh, from um, the committee. So, where shall we start? I, I'll, I'm, I'm not going to start in an obvious place, actually. I'll start somewhere um, maybe a wee bit unexpected, and the reason I'll start there is because you've all got divergent views on the, this particular issue, so I'll get a wee bit of them. Um, interaction going, shall we say. So the first one is, um, Professor MacDonald, in your paper you say uh, on page three that, and I quote, the remaining smaller taxes that I would recommend devolving are air passenger duty, capital gains tax and inheritance tax. So I'm wondering if you can just, um, uh, for the record, explain why you support the devolution of these taxes and I then like to um, uh, your colleagues, if they so wish, to comment with their own specific views on that, those issues. Thank you. Yeah, well, in, in broad terms, obviously, what I was seeking to do in, in the, the piece I wrote was to try and address the issue of the vertical fiscal imbalance, um, which is a big issue and has been a big issue in the, the Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament since its inception. Um, so my main focus is on, obviously, the bigger taxes, income tax, VAT and so on, and I'm sure we'll come back to them later. Um, as you've seen, I've got a table there where I try and apportion uh, different amounts from the taxes. So um, the bigger taxes are kind of straightforward. The smaller taxes, the ones you focused on, um, well, air passenger duty, we know there's been a big discussion about... Um, the environment in Scotland, the Greens are particularly interested in these issues. So control of uh, air passenger duty would be uh, something, I think, which would naturally be devolved or could be devolved. Um, inheritance tax and capital gains tax, they're, they're rather small taxes. I mean, I'm not going to go to the stake in these, as it were. Um, I, basically, what I'm saying there is I don't have an issue with uh, devolving these taxes. I mean, if you look at the evidence, I think, from... Um, I think it's Switzerland where they, they have uh, devolution within the cantons of these kind of taxes. It hasn't created any particular issues for the, the overall federal structure. So I don't see there being a particular problem uh, devolving these to, to the Scottish Parliament. Okay. Um, Professor uh, Heald or Professor Kay, would you like to comment? Um, I, think, I think I'd make of two points about those smaller taxes. I think one's going to be very careful about devolving taxes that people only want to reduce or abolish, mm -hmm. uh, because that's got, not going to f sort of resolve the, f the, the funding issues. Uh, smaller taxes introduce more questions of volatility, because it's obviously more difficult to work out what the block grant deduction would be. Um, capital gains tax, I think, probably fits alongside income tax. Uh, so, so, so what one did about income tax might well affect what one decided about capital gains tax. There's considerable opportunities for people to convert income into capital gains, and that's one reason why they sit, they sit aside. With inheritance tax, I, 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 I suspect you probably get a race to the bottom uh, with people trying to, trying to attract high income, high wealth uh, taxpayers into their jurisdiction. Professor Key. Um, I think... I, I'd agree with Professor Heal, and I'm sure we'll come back to this point, that uh, uh, there's a danger in devolving taxes simply because people wish they could be lower, because it's not going to be the case that all or perhaps very many taxes can be lower. But air pa with that caveat, air passenger duty seems to me unproblematic. Uh, inheritance tax and capital gains tax seem to me another matter altogether. I mean, inheritance tax... If there are material differences, uh, we're going to have to think hard 
about the implications of residence rules and people taking advantage of these residence rules. For capital gains tax, that problem seems to me to arise in spades. If one were to abolish, or if one were to devolve income tax, meaning devolve income tax on savings as well as income tax on earnings, and that's actually a different ball game from the business of devolving income tax on earnings. But if one were to devolve income tax on savings, one would start to think about devolving capital gains tax. But once again, we get into issues of Scottish, uh, of Scottish, what are Scottish assets, what are Scottish residents, and we get into the interaction between capital gains tax in Scotland and capital gains tax in England in quite a lot of cases if there are material differences. I think capital gains tax is probably a can of worms that one would prefer not to open. Okay, thank you. And obviously the biggie is uh, income tax and uh, Professor MacDonald, in your paper you said I have sympathy for proposals that involve the full devolution of income tax and uh, Professor Kay, in your paper you say, um, you know, obviously it would make sense initially to take over the existing UK income tax code in its entirety, over time this could be changed. But Professor Heal, you seem to have a lot more caveats in terms of this, so I am wondering if you can first of all uh, tell us your concerns about the devolution of inc full income tax and where you think the the boundaries should go. Now, I realise you've, you've, you've talked about this in your paper, but obviously for the, for the record, I'm quite keen on hearing your, your views directly. Also, uh, I would then again ask uh, Professor uh, MacDonald and Kay to, to comment if they so wish. M much depends what people mean by full devolution of income tax. If you look at the, the party submissions to the Smith Commission, mm -hmm. uh, the, differences aren't, the differences in substance aren't <coughs> actually as big as the rhetorical differences. Uh, because clearly, if, if, you, if by full devolution of income tax you mean that you start, start again and have a completely different Scottish income tax system to the UK system, that is quite different from Scotland deciding the, the, the rate bans and the thresholds. Um, I was at a conference, uh, as a conference last week organised by the UK Public Accounts Committee, in which I was told that there were, the UK tax system had 1140 reliefs and allowances. So there's massive, massive complexity in terms of in, in terms of the income in terms of the income tax system. Um, the it, going back a very long time in 1976, I proposed what became the Tutton tax. Um, I think the reason that wasn't used is that when there was a chance to use it, uh, the Scottish Parliament had too much money because the increases in health and education expenditure in England, and people were warned that uh, politicians were warned that if one used it in the downwards direction, the Treasury would exploit the lack of transparency of the block grant to actually punish Scotland in indirectly. That's right. So I think that the that, that I can understand politically that after the referendum, there's a wind of opportunity where people might get substantial devolution of tax powers that otherwise would have been difficult or in the very long term. Uh, but what, I think one has to think carefully about the capacity to, the capacity to run uh, a Scottish income tax and exactly what you mean by that. I mean, in terms of, for example, does the definition of income may, remain the same? Does the personal allowance remain the same? Uh, and what happens to curve tax bans and tax bans and tax rates. One of the points I make in my paper is the because of because of to some extent the switch to indirect taxes and VAT and the increases in the personal allowance for income tax, one's increasing the concentration of income tax revenues from a small proportion of income tax payers. So the kind of numbers I quote in the paper from memory are forty two uh, for, uh, forty two thousand uh, Scottish income tax payers actually pay uh, 22 per cent of Scottish income tax. So that one's got a very concentration on a very small number of people. Now, clearly, clearly, uh, the questions both of actual behavioural response to changes in to differentials between Scotland, Scotland and England and expectations of differentials could have significant effect because it hasn't mattered in the past whether one had a Scottish residence or not. And under the Tartan tax, the actual difference it could make uh, whether you were a Scottish resident or not a Scottish resident, was actually capped because the Tartan tax only applied uh, to the basic rate. Um, with the Kalman tax, the, the potential cost for a very high-income person is much higher, and clearly expectations about if Scottish income tax were completely separate, and by completely separate I'm talking about defi definition of income, 
uh, definition of income and so on, um, you, you could get very significant issues about residence and about m movements of population, mobility of population, and people pretending to move when they really haven't. Uh, for example, people have got residence in, residences, residences <coughs> in Scotland and in England as well. So how does it work in Europe where you've got all, a vast array of different <laughs> tax jurisdictions, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, you've got Germany, Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, all within a, you know, an hour's drive of each other, et cetera. I mean, surely you know these systems have been developed by many other countries over time. Well, I think there's also, I think the kind of, there's a psychological issue in the UK, uh, which, for example, doesn't apply in the US. Now, there's partly distance is partly a factor, uh, but I think the last time I checked, there were 23 US states had income tax powers, the others didn't. Now, the, the psych psychologically, partly because of the domination of UK politics by Westminster and by the UK and, and the kind of centralisation of the UK media, uh, you can imagine the kind of difficulty you will get, one will get politically with significant, even small differences between, between income tax. I think the more general... The more general point I would make is that in terms of tax devolution, you've got to be careful you don't take on lots of fiscal risks without actually having policy control. So that it's all right saying that Scotland should be funded, the Scottish Parliament should be funded by its own, own revenues. Now that crucially depends on whether you mean genuinely devolved taxes, where you control the tax, particularly the base and the rate, um, or you mean assignment of revenues. And Professor Kay describes assignment as cosmetic. So the question, the, the, the question is, within the United Kingdom, how much fiscal risk do you want to take on when you don't actually have the policy levers? If you're independent like Netherlands and Belgium, or if Scotland had the vote, yes, a bit, vote had been yes in the referendum, that's a different ballgame. But within the context of the United Kingdom, uh, when you don't have policy control over monetary policy or over the stance of fiscal policy, I'm, I'm, I'm he I hesitate about how much fiscal risk that one should take on. So, that, so just before I, I bring in your colleagues, what's your view then, if you can tell us, on the control of rates, bans and thresholds? Um, I think that that is a... I, I think the, the, the big issue is going to be about definition of income, and the definition of personal allowance. Uh, the, um, Scotland has congratulated itself on, it, on the maturity of its referendum campaign. I actually found the debate incredibly depressing. Uh, be, depressing because people th seem to think that you have, getting tax powers would mean you could spend more. Now, within the, context, within the context of the UK and Scottish fiscal position, and with what the kind of former head of, U of the IMF fiscal affairs uh, Department, Vito Tanzi, called fiscal termites, uh, governments are going to find it very difficult to maintain their, their tax base. So the danger, the, my, my worry about, about quote, too much devolution of, of, of income tax would be that one would get lots of arbitrage. Lots of a, a differences, would, differences would be exploited, and they would be exploited in a way that would probably kind of force down tax revenues. So if one wants to protect the tax base, one wants to protect the tax base, I think one has to be careful. One's only going to look at what's, hap what's actually happening in with corporation tax. Um, at the kind of Public Accounts Committee conference last week, uh, one, one speaker was predicting the demise of corporation tax in, within 10 years. That's probably fanciful, but if you look at what's actually happening about the downward, downward, downward movement of rates, and even when um, the UK is subscribing to the OECD uh, base erosion and profit shifting uh, 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 project, uh, the UK is using the patent box. So that there is a downward pressure, downward pressure on tax rates. If you want a smaller state, um, that's a good thing. If you don't want a smaller state, you should be very careful. Professor Key? I think there are a couple of important points there. One is that, uh, as Professor Heald is saying, in effect, with increasing mobility of labor, capital, and economic activity more generally, and the growth of activities where it's quite difficult to attach a place to the activity. That's undermining the ease of collecting tax generally. Corporation tax is probably the worst example of that problem, but it arises for a number of other taxes. But these are not either currently or in the foreseeable future insuperable problems. And actually, if we want to run 
wildly different taxes in Scotland. In the end, people will make these systems work. I think there's a difference, however, between the situation we'd, fa we'd face in Scotland under independence, in which you just have to sit down and make these things work and work out Scottish solutions to these problems, and the situation we face with devolution in a unitary state, where we are, have to ask the question, are the additional levers we would get from things that are going to be very complicated actually worth the bother of doing them? So that, as far as income tax is concerned, what it seems to me is likely to emerge from the kind of Smith discussions is giving Scotland control over, uh, over the rates with a banding um, pretty much as it is. That would give Scotland a lot of freedom to actually determine additional revenue from income tax if it wanted to. When one starts to ask, do we want in Scotland to take on responsibility for the detail of the structure, then one has to ask, are there advantages to doing that that offset the very considerable administrative problems and negotiating issues that will have, would have to be resolved vis-a-vis -vis particularly England, but also other countries in doing that. It's not obvious to me what the balance of that advantage is. Okay, thank you. Professor um, MacDonald? Yes, well, as I say in my submission, I mean, I come at this more as a macroeconomist uh, rather than from the, the microeconomics of, of the different uh, tax rates and so on. But I think if I can summarise, you know, Professor Hill's position, it, it's really an issue which is at the heart of this whole debate, and that is whether we try and retain stability of revenue through continuing with, with a, a block grant, mainly providing the, the, the revenue for the Scottish Parliament, or whether the Scottish Parliament is prepared to accept more risk. Now, as Professor Heald said, if, if you have uh, control over tax thresholds, um, you could end up punishing those who uh, pay hard, higher marginal tax rates, for example. Labour mobility is very high within the UK, so the argument is, as, as Professor Heald was implying, that these people would move south of the border. But, of course, that is the main disciplining effect of devolving uh, taxes, that the, the government knows that that can happen, and presumably one would expect them to take that into account in making their decisions. So uh, just simply because uh, labour and capital are, are mobile, I, I therefore would not rule out you know, further devolution of, of taxes, therefore. So mm -hmm. I, I would come at this from a different perspective. Um, and I think, again, picking up on... on Professor Hill said about the referendum. I, I do think there is a fundamental uh, misconception, I think, amongst the polity and also amongst the electorate as to what fiscal autonomy actually means. I think they mean if, I think people think if you get more fiscal autonomy, if you get devil max, if you get more, more uh, revenue, more revenue devolved, it automatically means more spending. Of course it doesn't. It means much more risk. And it's really, the kernel of the argument is how you handle that risk. And as I said in my submission, uh, I'm very keen for the Scottish Parliament to handle that risk in as optimal a way as possible, while still recognising that as part of the UK, we have, I think, very clearly voted for a, a, a social protection mechanism, which is about um, resource pooling and risk sharing. So I think these are the kind of balances that, that I would like to see, and I think that uh, sheds light on what I'm trying to say in my, uh, my submission. Okay, thank you. Now, we're nearly 20 minutes in. I haven't let my colleagues in yet, so I'm just going to ask one further question before I do let them in. And, um, it's in terms of our actual submission we got from the Scottish Futures Trust, actually, uh, um, in terms of their submission uh, to the Smith Commission. Uh, they're, they're actually giving evidence uh, following your own uh, uh, um, evidence and uh, we've talked to me a bit about not having the opportunity to kind of spend more if you like through uh, these various taxation routes or the high risks involved in that but what they've suggested is uh, in terms of borrowing there's a possibility of that because they said that um, Scotland should have the power to be able to determine the right level of infrastructure investment to affordably meet its economic and social objectives and how this investment is both funded and financed and what they're basically um, suggesting is that uh, constraints on borrowing powers should be removed entirely, pointing out that um, local authorities um, you know, uh, uh, don't have the same kind of restrictions that the Scottish Parliament is 
basically, and they, and they talk about it being inequitable that Scottish Government should have a cash value borrowing limit imposed as a reserve matter, but local authorities are effectively self-controlling under, under a codification of ability to repay. And so they're obviously suggesting that uh, that would allow um, the Scottish Government considerable freedom in terms of how it invests in, in, the, uh, in infrastructure and uh, obviously enhancing uh, Scotland's asset base, creating jobs along the way, etc. Just wondering if uh, each of the, the witnesses could comment on their view on that particular issue. Professor Kay, do you want to kick us off on that one? Um, I might begin by emphasising what both Professor MacDonald and Professor Heald have said about the, the widespread idea that um, fiscal devolution means Scotland has more money, and it doesn't. But bluntly, uh, at the moment, uh, there is a great deal of discussion of people wanting more powers in Scotland, when what they really mean is they want more money for the powers that Scotland in large parts already has. And bluntly, that money isn't coming, either from a block grant or from uh, uh, taxes. Uh, and that's the issue in relation to, that's an issue in relation to this infra additional infrastructure spending. Uh, the borrowing powers for Scotland would appear, in the first instance, to be a way of giving the Scottish Government more money. Indeed, that's in large part the way in which borrowing has been discussed over the last few years. So I think Scotland ought to have more borrowing powers, but I think it ought to implement these borrowing powers rather carefully, rather slowly, and probably in present situations, given the level of the UK national debt, probably not really at all. And I think we should be careful about saying that there would be benefits from infrastructure spending uh, the fact that something, in, I think we need a lot more infrastructure spending in Scotland and in the UK, but it needs to be well targeted infrastructure spending. And, you know, we're sitting in Edinburgh watching, going along Princess Street every day, what must be one of the worst infrastructure projects in the history of the world in terms of the uh, capacity for useful useful infrastructure and revenue generation that it, uh, that it, that, that it provides. Okay, I won't touch on which political party supported that and which ones opposed <laughs> it. Right, I, I, I have no well idea. Of that. Sure. Um, but uh, <laughs> Professor uh, MacDonald, do you want to comment on the borrowing issue? Yes, well, I would echo what Professor Kay said about the, the infrastructure issues. I, I think he's absolutely right in that. Uh, I think, as I said in my submission, if you are going to say to the Scottish Parliament, you have to take on more fiscal risk if we're going to devolve more powers, then you've got to um, allow them to borrow. And um, this fits in with my notion of the hard budget constraint that you've got to give, you know, for this to work, it's not just about taxing at the margins. You've got to move away from a, what I call, a, and others have called a pocket money parliament, sorry, but you've got to move to a parliament which, which has a substantial amount of revenue it, it raises itself. And if it does that, it therefore faces risks. Uh, if there's a, a, a recession, it's not going to have the same uh, risk pooling, uh, risk sharing that it would if it hadn't got these revenues devolved or assigned, and therefore it has to have some way of making it up. And I would argue that um, the, the Scottish Parliament should be allowed to borrow for that reason as well, and it should be borrowing on the open market, because I believe that's the only really clean and effective way uh, to bring market discipline and to be consistent with the hard budget constraint. I mean, there are obviously ways of doing that through the Treasury, um, but that would then bring in all, all manner of uh, uh, stability pacts and so on, which I personally don't think are as clean as, as simply allowing the Scottish Parliament to borrow on the market, because the, the, on the marketplace, because the market will ultimately discipline the Scottish Government in its borrowing, and, and so we should, we should get an optimal outcome in that sense. Okay, Professor Hilt. Um, just, just to pick up something um, Professor MacDonald said, um, I think that I, I get very worried when people start talking about, for example, 54% of the budget of the Scottish Parliament being funded by its own, own revenue, without making it clear that quite a lot of that revenue is outside policy control. So I don't really accept 
the way that Professor MacDonald uses the idea of the hard budget constraint, if you're talking about revenue you do not control, so assigned VAT revenues, for example, um, Scotland might, might either get a bonus in terms of VAT revenue, if the, depending on the UK government decisions, or, 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 the, or the opposite way around. And I think that one of the things we should come back to is, 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 is the question of whether you look at the, the capacity to raise revenue at the margin or the average percentage of, of your spending that you finance. On the point about borrowing, um, I agree with what's been said. I think that if you, if you, have, more tax rev if you have more tax responsibilities, uh, you actually require more borrowing power simply for smoothing purposes. Um, on the question, of, the question of infrastructure spending, um, I've made a good academic living for quite a long time out of public-private partnerships. And what worries me is that kind of people, that what we will see, because fiscal control is, is going to be very tight, uh, we will see the kind of move on from public-private partnerships to guarantees. And one sees that in the United Kingdom in the context of the Hinkley Point C uh, power, power station, where the, where, the, where, the, where the UK government is effectively, uh, but not transparently, contracting to take the output for the lifetime of the project. So I think that on the question of borrowing, uh, there are question, there's the question of borrowing for, for capital purposes, borrowing for, for, for revenue smoothing. Uh, but also there is the issue, about the issue about the constraints imposed by membership of the European Union. Uh, while the UK remains part of the European Union, uh, simply because the UK government is, will, has a, an overall responsibility uh, for the kind of UK public borrowing. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm going to open up this. Sorry, Press K, did you want to add something? There? Right. Yes, I, I just had two points to add to that. One is, I think, realistically, the UK Treasury is not actually going to allow Scottish Government what would be substantive borrowing powers. I think there are red lines as far as they are concerned and I feel pretty confident that that is going to be one. The second point which also relates to the UK Treasury is, as Professor Heald is saying, the amount of uh, off-balance sheet financing of various kinds which has been engaged in and is increasingly engaged in in order to pretend that people are not, the government is not borrowing as much money uh, as it is. We've been doing that in Scotland as well, and I would feel very keen that if and when we have a beefed up fiscal commission in Scotland, a large part of its responsibilities should be policing that particular activity so that we're not landing future generations with liabilities which we've taken off balance sheet and shoved under the carpet for a period of years. Okay, thank you for that. I think it's quite important. It's, it's the issue of this hard budget constraint uh, relative to the taxing at the margin. Um, if I can give you an example, I do believe that if, say, the Scottish Parliament were responsible for 90% of its revenue uh, generation, even if that is coming from the, the assignment of taxes, and the Scottish Parliament knows that the revenue it obtains in the next period will be conditional on how it spends its funding, then that is going to give you a very different outcome, a, a more accountable outcome, in my view, to a situation where it only has to raise 2% of its funding and the rest is from a block grant, where it relies on the block grant to fund its uh, spending in the next period. I believe these are two very different uh, scenarios, and I believe that even if you're assigning taxes but don't have control over um, the, the tax in terms of the devolution, I still think it makes a big difference the magnitude of the budget that is actually devolved in some sense to the Parliament. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll open up the session now. The first person to ask questions will be Michael, to be followed by Jamie. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. And I'll, I'll use uh, Professor MacDonald's paper to get me into this, this area of where I've, I've got a particular interest. But it's in relation to uh, the, the block grant or the continuation of the block grant in terms of um, social protection systems, uh, as you call them. Um, Northern Ireland currently has its welfare uh, system devolved, but it has maintained a parity with the, the rest of the UK. Is what you're describing similar to what happens in Northern Ireland, or are you concerned about that relationship as it currently exists between 
the, the devolved uh, welfare system in, in Ireland and the, the north of Ireland and the rest of the UK? Well, to be candid, I haven't, I haven't really focused on the Northern Ireland situation, but I mean, I think my point is that um, if you go for a purely fiscal autonomy type of setup, um, then you're not engaged in what I refer to as the, the risk pooling revenue sharing. And I believe that, um, well, I believe the outcome of the referendum was that people want to be part of that risk sharing revenue pooling mechanism. And I believe that's largely because they want the, the social protection, what I call the social protection or welfare budget to be at the centre. Now, of course, that is an issue which is open for discussion, and I do discuss that in the paper in terms of some perhaps marginal changes to the spending, but, uh, uh, sorry, the welfare budget uh, spend. But as I see it at the moment, rather than focusing on whether to devolve more powers in terms of the spend side, really what we've got to be focusing on is getting the existing fiscal gap in, into shape before we start talking about even further spending uh, devolution to, to the Scottish Parliament. So that's really where I'm coming from as a macroeconomist, I think, yeah. It's, it's how do we, you know, as, as, we, as I say in my note and as everyone uh, concedes, the Scottish Parliament already has a significant chunk of spending, depending on how you define it, between 50 and 60 percent, but very little in the way of uh, compensating tax revenues. That means the Parliament's not accountable, sorry, the government's not accountable properly, so how do we address that? So. I think that's how I'd answer your question. I'd rather focus more on the revenue side at the moment until we get that kind of balance right before thinking about more major uh, spending devolution. Okay, thanks for that. That's helpful. Uh, Professor Key, you touch on this issue as well. You, you raised the question as to whether it's possible to, as you say, unpick the benefit system. And you also uh, raised the question about the arguments for... Uh, the connection between income tax and benefit policy. Do you want to expand a bit on what you mean by the dangers of unpicking the, uh, the system? Uh, and there are two issues here. One is the, um, you've just described the situation in Northern Ireland in relation to benefits, where there is power to change things, but in fact nothing has changed. And there is kind of here a devolution, what I think of as a devolution paradox, particularly in what has been traditionally a rather centralised state as the UK, that you as politicians will find that your constituents will allow you to make things better, but will not allow you to make anything worse than in the rest of the UK. And actually the only solution which, uh, given a budget constraint, the only thing you can do in that situation is leave things unchanged. So you get the situation which we've described in Northern Ireland, which we've had here in relation to the tartan tax, which is you have the power to change things but you actually don't use them. The second question is uh, the one I raised of can we unpick the benefit system? That is, can we find parts of the benefit system that we could devolve to Scotland in meaningful ways that would actually give Scotland uh, the power and possibly the desire to change them without devolving everything to do with the benefit system? And to my mind, the the desirability of having an integrated benefit system and indeed an integrated benefit system which is integrated not just with other parts of the benefit system but with other parts of social policy and indeed which takes account of the structure of income tax as well uh, makes it quite difficult to satisfactorily unpick bits of that kind of package. So I tend towards the view in this, this situation, one really is faced with all or nothing, that either you want to devolve everything or you don't actually want to devolve very much. Okay, Professor Heald, do you want to comment on this? Um, could I pick up a couple of points? Um, with, no, with Northern Ireland, essentially what you've got is administrative control uh, of, the, of, of, of the social security system. Uh, the, the, the UK funding depends upon them following UK policy. And there's currently a, a major political argument in Northern Ireland about the so-called bedroom tax, uh, which has not been, not been implemented in Northern Ireland. And there's arguments between the Northern Ireland executive and the Treasury ab 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 about that. Uh, so it's essentially, it, it, it's the, you've got to be very careful about language. 
uh, there is not devolution in practice because, because the willingness of the UK exchequer to fund the Northern Ireland benefits depends on basically doing, basically doing, the, same, basically doing the same thing. Northern Ireland raises another issue, which is that if you want to devolve income tax, Scotland is sufficiently close uh, to the UK average on almost everything that you can basically forget, uh, forget about tax base equalisation. You cannot do that about Wales and Northern Ireland because they are very much poorer uh, than, than, than Scotland and England. So that, that one of the points I would argue, if, if one wants the outcome of this process to be a stable new devolution settlement, we have to think about how the changes would affect Northern Ireland and might in future affect Northern Ireland and Wales. And so that, that, that although it would be very easy to go ahead with income tax devolution and basically saying Scotland's sufficiently average that we won't get involved in that kind of complication, we have to think about it because, because of the extension to, extension to um, uh, possible extension to Northern Ireland and Wales, at least the, 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 the chance for them to decide whether they want to go that way. Um, I, I agree with much that Professor Kay said about the, the question of the benefit system as a whole and the, and the question of the relationship between tax and, tax and benefits. I mean, the UK policy over the last, uh, last 25 years has been very much in the direction of the integration of taxes and benefits. Uh, and where there would seem to be policy benefits in devolution welfare, for example, housing benefit, housing benefit, you then come into the problem which the Scottish Government has made in its submission to the, uh, to the Smith Commission, that housing benefits are going to be rolled up into universal credit. So that's an area we have to think about, have to think about very, very carefully. Okay, so this is a sort of follow-up question to any of you or all of you who want, who want to possibly answer it. But in terms of the, the debate, and you've all mentioned earlier, that there is this perception that devolution means more spending in the, the areas that you want to bring it. The, the idea that, that devolving benefits would therefore, following uh, that logic, suggest that what it means is that the benefits will be uh, increased uh, in Scotland. Is that your reading of, of that argument and, and what concerns would you have about um, benefit tourism, I think is, it's called, uh, that if we were to have differentials between uh, Scotland uh, and the rest of the UK, what, are, what is the likelihood of there being benefit tourism? You're taking me outside my, my comfort zone. Well, but but, the, but the, the, <laughs> the, um, I would answer it in, in, in a particular way. I think, I think there is a kind of a view at the kind of UK level that certain cash benefits should be the same across the UK. Now, we all know that if you live in London, old age pensions aren't, don't, don't buy you as many goods and services as they would do in, in the north of England. But we stick to the idea of, of equal, equal uh, cash, pay, cash payments. So I think that one of the problems, one of the problems about devolving welfare would be that people would expect it to go up. The, 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 and the, the, then you immediately get the question is, what's the, what, what are you going to finance it from? What are, you going to, what are you going to cut? I mean, for example, you could argue, and people have argued in Northern Ireland, uh, that there's a case for lower benefits in Northern Ireland because wages are low, generally lower in the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland economy. But you can see the political difficulty that would, that would involve. So we have a kind of... The, the, pe people have two quite different attitudes. They want local choice, regional, national, subnational choice, but they immediately raise the question of the postcode lottery the minute you actually... And, and to some extent, the UK settled on the, thing that you, on, on, on the position that you can actually devolve service provision, like health and education, but you do not devolve the level of... You don't vary the level of cash benefits. So I don't see any, I don't see any benefit in a, a, any advantage in devolving you know, cash benefits unless you're willing to accept the possibility of them varying. And again, the, my, my concern would be the expectation would be that they will become more generous. Yeah, I mean, my general principle would be, and, and this is what I try to bring across in my comments, is that the whole point about the devolution 
further devolution of uh, powers to the sub-central government, the Scottish Parliament in this case, is that they're better able to reflect the preferences of the electorate in Scotland. And one example I gave is we know that in Scotland we've had a different uh, policy with respect to the elderly. And so I think in that sense there's perhaps a case for um, devolving attendance allowance to, to the Scottish Parliament, for example. In terms of the example that you gave, I suppose I agree with, with uh, David's point that, um, it, I mean, if it's, if it's actual benefit payments, then you're going to run in perhaps to the same problem that you run into with the tax side of things, that if you tax differentially, you, you will get this mobility and you will, in your sense, maybe get benefit tourism. But uh, you can see things that are not, uh, sorry, benefits that are not um, quite related to labour mobility, such as the, the bedroom tax, for example, Scottish policy on that may reflect different preferences and maybe there is a case for, for example, devolving benefits which are not specifically related to the mobility of people. Okay. Professor Kay. Can't see a world in the foreseeable future in which Scotland has enough money to pay benefits sufficiently superior to the levels of in England uh, for benefit tourism actually to be a problem. It's back to this issue that is underlying all of this, which is the tendency to think that devolution of powers means more money to spend on these powers, and it doesn't. Okay. Well, thank, you, Gavin. thank you, Michael. Uh, Jamie, to be followed by Gavin. Hey, I've got a, a question um, related to Barnett. We're just given the exchange you've just had there, gentlemen. I'm just wondering how much evidence there is beyond some of the pages of uh, some of the right-wing newspapers for such a thing as benefit tourism in the first place? Um, as I said a few minutes ago, you're taking me outside my comfort zone. I, mm -hmm. it's not a, you'd have to ask a, a social policy expert uh, about that. I think the answer is not very much, but one has to make the observation that it's a lot easier for someone from England to move to Scotland and feel comfortable here than it is for someone who's unemployed in Romania to move to England or Scotland and feel comfortable here. Okay, thank you. Um, we know that the Scottish Government's uh, submission to uh, the Smith Commission, they, they, their perspective, their starting point is that essentially the, the Parliament should resolve its revenue and uh, make payments to Westminster <laughs> for reserved uh, services, but we also know that the Smith Commission's work on the basis of consensus, so we don't know where that process is going to end. So if that isn't the position, then presumably there's still going to be the allocation of resources and then the Barnett formula comes into question and uh, or into play, uh, I should say. Uh, and uh, I want to turn to Professor Heald and Professor Kay's uh, paper, because Professor Heald, you sit in your paper, The Vow, and then in the best academic tradition, you list the authors, which I liked as Cameron et al, 2014, <laughs> on the front page of the Daily Record on Tuesday, 6th September, included the three leaders' commitment to the continuation of the Barnett allocation of resources. Although this sounds definitive, the actual meaning is ambiguous. And Professor Key, you say, whatever commitments may appear to have been made in the last days of the referendum campaign, the Barnett form is now inevitably under press. So I wonder if you could talk about the ambiguity that Professor Heald uh, speaks of in terms of the vow and the pressure you speak of, uh, Professor Key. Uh, I mean, I think the ambiguity is that operated literally, the Barnett formula since 1978 ought to have produced substantial convergence between public spending levels in Scotland and the UK as a whole. It has not actually done so. And that is, I think, a measure of the discretion which the Treasury has exercised, the UK Treasury has exercised in what have not been well articulated ways uh, to be relatively generous to Scotland uh, in that settlement. I think after what has happened this year, we now have to face the fact that the Barnett formula, which previously was something I think understood by only a few politicians and academics, or actually only a few politicians and academics had heard of it, is now something which is very much on the political agenda and that it is quite difficult, frankly, to find an objective justification for the generosity that Scotland receives under the, under the Barnett formula. 
So I think whether the Barnett formula survives in a formal sense or not, we in Scotland have to acknowledge that this is going to come under pressure and resistance and resentment in a way that I think has not been true in the past. I, I discussed these issues with the committee in June. Um, the, the one point I would disagree with Professor Kay about, I think that one of the, the reasons there hasn't been convergence has less been less treasury generosity to Scotland, more relative population change. Uh, the, 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 proper, the, the numbers that I want aren't in the public domain and probably don't exist anymore within the treasury. But the, but the, point, the point is that the convergence has been largely offset by Scotland's falling relative, popula falling relative population. So if Scotland, if you have, uh, Jim and Margaret Cuthbert have made this point uh, several times, uh, particularly in the 2000s. If, if you didn't have Scotland's relative population falling, I think we'd have actually got the convergence. Um, one of the attractions to me of Barnet is it's a population adjustment mechanism. We've had a population adjustment mechanism for most of the time uh, between, between 1880s and now. And one of the advantages of having a population adjustment mechanism compared with a kind of detailed needs assessment is if you've got a detailed needs assessment, leaving aside whether Scotland's overfunded or underfunded now, uh, the, what you do is work out how much Scotland needs to spend on health, how much Scotland needs to spend on education, social services, and so on. And it makes it very much more difficult to maintain the block nature of, 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 that, of, that, of, that, of, that, of that system. And so the, 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 the kind of what I would like to have now after the vow is a serious discussion about the kind of a, a population adjustment mechanism versus a regular needs, regular needs assessment. Now, one of the problems about a needs assessment, um, we've got plenty of, uh, I'm sorry, there's a very obvious international example of how you do it, which is, which is Australia with the Commonwealth Grants Commission. Um, but I think that people, people underestimate two difficulties. One of them is how big an exercise that will actually be to do it properly. And secondly, the toxic political climate within which it would, within which it would be done. Because there are plenty of kind of exercises around. The Holton Commission exercise, for example, that said that the block grant should be cut by four, million, four billion, uh, is going to automatically produce the allegation that people have decided the re result before the exercise starts. Uh, so there's, a, there's, a, there's this question about Barnet, in my mind, is the lack of attention paid to Barnet during the Labour government. In 2002, um, Alistair MacLeod and I published proposals uh, for, the, for the Institute for Public Policy Research on what you had to do to Barnet to actually deal particularly with the problem of Wales. Basically, nothing happened, and that was partly because there was so much money coming through the form coming through the formula that, that it had no poli no, politi no political no political attention at all. Uh, but clearly, uh, the, res the resentment against Scotland is going to grow, and Scotland gets blamed, for example, for the way in which English distribution formula treat the northeast of England badly. So Barnet gets blamed for all sorts of things that are actually nothing to do with Barnet, but we do need. A, we do need a debate now about how the block grant works. And I disagree with, with people, with people who are uh, prominent public figures who have said that Barnet doesn't matter because the block grant is going to be smaller. But it matters, it matters crucially because um, while, while the UK government has got most of the major revenue sources, it, it, it affects how much public spending the UK government is willing to underwrite in Scotland. So will you talk of ambiguity, essentially what you're saying there is that there could be enough uh, leeway for the UK government to come up with essentially a new system but just still target the Barnet formula and they've, they've kept to their vow? Is that what you, well, you're it, it certainly changed the language debate because I thought what would happen is that Barnet's name would go uh, and something similar would actually remain. Mm. Uh, we, we may now get the position where the name Barnet stays, but it actually, the substance becomes actually the substance becomes actually different. No, my concern was you can. I would tend to interpret, want to interpret the vow, meaning that the kind of population adjustment system remains with periodic needs assessments. 
uh, which I've always expected there would be a needs assessment in due course, but without, without b treating Scotland as a region within, English, uh, within the context of English uh, needs assessment for health and a local government. So the question is, is Barnet the kind of system whereby, um, whereby the Treasury cannot get its hands on particular Scottish programmes that it doesn't like, or Northern Ireland programmes or, or, or Welsh, or Welsh programmes? Or does Barnet mean more favourable public expenditure treatment for Scotland? Now, if I was a, reader of the daily, a, a regular reader of the Daily Record, I suspect I would take that to mean that Scottish public spending was being protected. So that, that is going to be the, the question. Is it the mechanism that's been protected? And I think the, 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 the mechanism is over-criticised, uh, in part because the Labour government didn't properly maintain the system. It just ignored it while, uh, while there was plenty of money around. Or does it mean that Scotland, it, or Scotland is going to keep its expenditure advantage over, the rest, over, over uh, much of the rest of England? We've talked about uh, the assignment of VAT a little already, and we know, obviously, due to uh, European Union uh, uh, jurisdiction that uh, VAT can't be devolved in terms of, of setting the level. Um, both uh, Professor Kay and Professor Heald uh, talk about uh, the assignment of VAT. You, Professor Kay, you describe it as, and I think Professor Heald has already referred to this, you describe uh, VAT assignment as a cosmetic uh, change, and uh, Professor Heald, you also have a little to say um, about uh, VAT assignment as well. I suppose the, the que there's three questions that follow on. Should the, the fundamental one, should VAT be assigned? The second one is, does the Scottish Parliament have uh, the requisite uh, levers just now, or should there be other levers that, that come that can actually influence the uh, revenue that would be uh, accrued through VAT? And although uh, presumably it would still be the responsibility of Westminster to set the rate if VAT was being assigned, should the Scottish Parliament have some form of, of statutory role in terms of at least being consulted as to what the, the level should be? Um, I'm not dogmatically against all tax assignment. What I don't like is a representation of getting assigned revenues as being your own taxes. Uh, the, the, the places where it works, um, the most obvious case is Germany, uh, assignment works because of the powers of the Bundesrat, because the Bundesrat has those kind of negotiating powers uh, with, with, with the federal government. Um, because, there is a, because there is a political momentum that demands that something big happens, I would not be surprised to see partial devolution of partial assignment of, of VAT revenues. Uh, but, but clearly the policy levers are going to remain, policy levers are going to remain uh, with the UK government. And one of the things that, that, that is striking, I was looking at the Northern Ireland Net Fiscal Balance Report recently, and that has become a bigger source of revenue in Northern Ireland than income tax. And on, on, on the basis of present direction of travel, that might well happen in terms of the future JERS numbers in, 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 a few, in a few years' time. And I think what would happen is that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament would start, would start arguing with the, UK, with, with the UK Government the UK Treasury about, about, about VAT. Uh, the, UK, the UK has got a very narrow base VAT compared with most uh, European countries. Uh, I think it's about 55% of consumer expenditure is within, is within VAT. Uh, that helps the problem, helps the wrong word, but that contributes to the problem of, uh, of, the, of the tax gap on, 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 on VAT. And the kind of Murley's, commi Murley's Committee uh, recommended a broadening of the VAT, uh, of VAT tax base. Now, that is extremely political di politically difficult at any time. I think probably even more politically difficult uh, during the context of context of austerity, so I think what will what one of the consequences of assigning that revenues is that yourselves and the Scottish government are going to want to have a say uh, in UK VAT policy. Now, whether the UK government is willing to concede that, and it comes back to the problem of the UK being very asymmetric in the context of the symmetric federalism of Germany, it's a lot easier to see where the levers for consultation and participation are, very much more difficult in the UK. 
I can't honestly see the Scottish Government arguing with the UK Government that VAT ought to be imposed on food and children's clothing, mm -hmm. even though I agree with Professor Heald, and I think there's a view which most people have looked fairly objectively at the VAT base in the UK have come to, that our VAT, like Merleys, that our VAT, VAT base is actually really narrower than it should be for an efficient overall system of taxation. So again, it won't, Scotland might want to argue for that kind of say. I don't think it, actually, it would actually want to have that say, even if it wasn't, or to say these things, even if it was actually able to do so. President McDonald, I've not been meaning to neglect you, but I know you've, you've said something about uh, VAT assignment, so if you want to, to say anything in relation to this area. Only, only just to confirm, as you've said, it is a reserve tax, so we, we, can't, uh, we can't obviously devolve that tax. So the only way we can do anything about that is by an assignation. And as I said in my um, submission, I, I would propose that there is a, a significant chunk of, of VAT assigned to the Scottish Parliament, about 50%. Okay. Uh, one last question, if that's okay, uh, convener. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Professor Hill, you say in your paper of uh, the UK Treasury does not have a financial stake in the Scottish income tax base. I would expect both malicious actions and malign neglect. Can you, you say what you mean by this and also given a specific example, do we also already see a bit of, um, maybe malign might be too uh, harsh, but do we already see a degree of neglect when we, we look at the process for the block grant adjustment arising out of the taxes that have been devolved, we already, we're still in the situation where the UK Treasury hasn't uh, given any clear indication how the block grant is going to be adjusted in relation to taxes that have been devolved already. So do we see this process a little already and, and can you set out what you, your concerns are by when you say uh, the expectation of both malicious action, actions and malign uh, neglect? My adjectives were chosen to attract attention. Uh, to the issue. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 you, one, of the, one of the things you have to think about is you can't change the system of the government of Scotland within the United Kingdom without thinking about the UK. And I spent 21 years as Specialist Advisor to the Treasury Committee of the House of Commons uh, and at the end of that 21 years, became more and more depressed about the way that the UK runs its public, fin runs its public finances. So I think that one of the, the, the kind of budget die is a completely artificial occasion whereby the Chancellor has to find some rabbit to pull out the hat to catch, catch the opposition off guard. And the things, which, uh, the things which catch people off guard are sometimes the things that go spectacularly wrong in the, in, 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 in the longer term. Uh, one of them I remember is Gordon Brown's uh, zero starter rate of corporation tax, which encouraged a lot of uh, dubious incorpor incorporations. So I think that, that if, if one's going to get a stable system working with Scotland having significant policy control over income tax, I think it means that the UK has to bring its budget forward uh, from March, April to November and actually engage the UK Parliament much more ser seriously in seriously in discussions about the budget. So, so basically, uh, the Treasury Committee of the House of Commons doesn't fulfil its role as a tax and spend committee. It's heavily involved in other things, other worthy things, but doesn't actually act as a, act, act as a, as a budget committee. Um, the, Scottish, the, the Scottish Government under Calman has to notify by the 30th of November uh, what, the, what the Scottish rate of income tax is. Um, the, the UK government can, do th can in March or April change rates and tax bans and control, and control how much money will be brought in by those decisions that have been taken earlier, uh, earlier by, the, by the Scottish Parliament. So one actually has to make sure that there is a basis for coordination, for coordination of uh, income tax so if, once the Scottish Parliament gets beyond Calman type um, income tax powers, it's crucially important to have some mechanism for coordination between the UK level and the UK level and the, uh, and the um, uh, Scottish level. And it's not obvious to me 
as on broader issues like monetary policy and control of the Bank of England, that the UK government actually has even thought these things through. So that, that, that the particular point about malign neglect would be the question about resourcing of HMRC in context of residence. Um, Professor Kay was making the point that residence matters fundamentally more important once you start devolving income tax than it did before. Did before. Whether somebody was a Scottish income tax payer or a UK income tax payer uh, might be important in terms of certain statistical analyses, but it didn't affect what tax people pay. So one's got to be very careful to make sure that the Treasury-controlled HMRC puts enough resources into making sure that people's residence decisions, residence decisions are truthfully declared. Because I emphasised earlier that, that you know, with 42,000 people contributing a very large proportion of, uh, a significant proportion of Scottish income tax revenues, uh, you know, that tax base is at risk. And the UK, the UK government, if it wanted, could attract taxpayers, could attract taxpayers by changes it, that it makes in the UK income tax. You talk there of the, the need for investment in HMRC, the trend over a long period of time, but the UK government seems to have been disinvestment from HMRC. Are you confident that, well, you, you already said you don't really, you're not confident that they're thinking these things through, so it's a pretty gloomy outlook you've got there, is it not? I mean, HMRC has been under, I mean, H, HMRC is going through a technological revolution about the way that the tax system works in terms of, you know, its IT, its IT systems. And it's very easy from outside to criticise people uh, for getting it wrong. So you can imagine, you can see why the labour force of HMRC will change uh, as, as the nature of their operating systems change. But if you're asking me, does the UK put enough money into tax enforcement? The answer is no. Thank you. Okay, Gavin, to be followed by John. Okay. Um, first question is a very narrow one uh, for Professor Heald. I just You made the comment that um, VAT is a bigger deal than income tax in Northern Ireland currently. Is there any specific reason for that? Oh, I think the... the, the I mean, the, 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 the trend and basic right over the last 20 years has been down. Income tax thresholds have gone up significantly and VAT rates have gone up. Uh, and, I mean, it's not... You know, it, it's one of these accidental consequences of UK decisions... I mean, nobody sat in London saying we, we'll change the composition of Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland tax revenue, but Northern Ireland is a fairly low-wage economy, so that, 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 it, that, that putting the threshold up is going to have a big effect. And, and you're changing the balance of taxation between income tax and, and, and VAT is, is, is going to have that effect. So there was no Northern Ireland content to the policy. It's just a manifestation of, of what happened uh, with, with, a relatively low income, with a relatively low income economy and a much higher threshold. Well, there is a Northern Ireland content in the sense that Northern Ireland is a low-wage economy in a way that Scotland is not. Sure. OK, well, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, the second question there is something we've not really touched on so far, but you've all commented on it in your papers. Um, corporation tax. Uh, I would just like each of you really to expand on why you reached the views that you did in your papers about the um, uh, devolution or non-devolution uh, of corporation tax. And maybe just spe specific reference to the, the legality issue. That's not an issue I'd really encountered much before in uh, discussion of that topic, but a couple of you have mentioned that quite specifically, so I'd be keen just to, um, for the record, to, for you to expand on your views on corporation tax. Uh, I mean, my understanding is that um, uh, the EU prevents us, in general, having differential rates of corporation tax within a member state without a special justification, which is quite hard to construct in the case of Scotland. As to whether we would want to do it, I think if we could, we probably would want to do it because it's, in effect, because of the point we made, uh, I, made I made earlier really about the mobility of uh, things in the present world. You can not just attract economic activity, but you can attract the appearance of economic activity for purposes of your tax base by having a significantly lower rate. That's the reason why Scotland as the smaller part of the union might want to do it, 
It's also a reason why England, as the larger part of the Union, would want to stop Scotland doing it. And I think that would be the outcome of this particular discussion. So I don't think devolution of corporation tax is, in that sense, going to be on the agenda, except for a plus conceivably to a small degree. But the small degree is not, for these reasons, worth doing. Yeah, I, mean, I said my submission for basically the same reasons that Professor Kay has given, that it sh the tax shouldn't be devolved. Um, one European legislation. We know that Ireland has, in the past, had a much lower corporation tax, but obviously that loophole is going to be uh, closed now, and I, I don't think that there is the same scope within Europe to do this. Um, you know, tax competition, I mean, I was initially attracted to devolution of, of, of some taxes, like corporation tax, in terms of tax competition. I mean, it, it, it seems to work rather well in some, some federal countries, in Canada, at the margin, but again, as Professor Kay has said, given the asymmetric nature of the UK, I doubt it would work here in the sense that we've got a much bigger partner who would probably react. And I think the other thing against it would be that if we were, if we were talking about this 10 years ago when corporation tax was a much higher level, then perhaps there would have been more sympathy for some tax competition. But now that it's down around the 20% mark, it's harder to see that, um, you know, that that is going to work. So in my, my uh, submission, I've said that I don't see any issue with assigning corporation tax, but I wouldn't see it being devolved. I think the, there's one specific Northern Ireland point I would make. Um, I wrote a paper for Northern Ireland Economic Council in 2003 when discussion of Northern Ireland co uh, devolved corporation tax was running very strongly. Uh, it's still the issue still around and nothing ever happens. Uh, the... There may have been a time in the political history of Northern Ireland when the European Commission might have been willing to tolerate a lower rate of corporation tax. But there's the issue that if one part of the UK had a lower rate of corporation tax than the other, you're going to get both diversion of genuine, genuine diversion of economic activity and also the fake diversion of profits. So the kind of, you can see very clearly why the UK government is very reluctant the UK government probably on this issue hides behind the European Union rules about, lack, about, uh, about the uh, variation of corporation tax within a member state. Um, I've, read, I've read the Azores judgment and the subsequent judgments at the European Court of Justice, um, but in terms of a detailed answer on that, you'd have to ask a, uh, ask, ask a, a, a lawyer. I think one of the points about corporation tax as well is that the, there is a... The stories that one gets about Amazon, Google, Starbucks are important in the sense that this is a source of revenue loss, but they're also important in the, in the sense of creating the impression among the electorate that certain companies and individuals are actually outside the tax rules. So I think that is a significant threat. I think one of, the, one of my fears about the tax system is the loss of legitimacy of, of the tax system, and that given the kind of difficulty that large states have in terms of protecting their, their, their tax base, I think that having differences between, having differences between, the UK, between Scotland and the rest of the UK on corporation tax would lead to a lot of arbitrage by very clever, by very clever lawyers. Um, so, so I would be very cautious. I'm mean, sorry, I, I, I don't think for... I don't think that corporation tax devolution is on the agenda at all. Um, I would not be in favour of it if it was on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, next issue then, again, in I guess similar format. I'm just, you've all commented on it. I'm keen, though, for the, for the sake of the record and for you just to expand on it. Your views on the devolution, uh, or your views on not devolving, um, national insurance... Perhaps maybe Professor MacDonald to, to go first this time. Yeah, well, I advocated that uh, it potentially we could uh, devolve a, a portion of, of national insurance. I mean, I think it's always been thought that national insurance was uh, geared towards the, the welfare state, and that was obviously the original, um, the original intention and how it originally the, the, the tax panned out. But I think with the passage of time, it, it, it is simply a tax on in income and a tax on employers. So 
uh, in that sense, if we believe t taxing income is the, the key tax to, to tax in, in a devolved sense, then I don't see anything against um, devolving a, a portion of, of national income, uh, national insurance rather, tax. Um, whether it's the employers that bear the burden or, or the, the employees that bear the burden, I suppose, is, is the other issue. Uh, which of the two components do you believe is more mobile, perhaps, would, would, would determine that. But I, I personally certainly wouldn't rule out the devolution of national insurance. Okay. Right, I think um, I've, ma I've made the point that I think that the devolution of... Uh, benefits and the welfare side of things probably is largely an all or nothing uh, area. Uh, as Professor MacDonald has said, national insurance contributions are traditionally and to some degree formally linked to benefit payments. They needn't be either in whole or part. You could easily see national insurance being recast as, a, uh, as an employment tax in whole or part, uh, which could then be devolved. However, devolving an employment tax is not materially different from devolving income tax on earnings, so that it doesn't actually, in substance, give the Scottish Government a, a power that it wouldn't have as a result of the devolution of income tax on earnings. Um, I mean, economists tend to regard uh, national insurance as just a, a second income tax. Uh, politicians find that you can put up national, you can promise not to increase the basic rate of income tax, but you can actually put up national insurance. Uh, there's also the contested area of the extent to which employers' national insurance is actually paid for by by employees. Uh, so that the the it, it, it's a, a kind of it's an area that the UK level needs urgent attention and so that leaving aside the more general questions about the kind of pooling of risk through social protection across the United Kingdom that would be an that would be getting into an incredibly difficult policy area uh, but some of the inconsistencies we've got for example in terms of having different thresholds are a consequence of how politicians perceive uh, national insurance is something which the electorate doesn't think of as income tax. Also, uh, the UK is not by no means the only country that does this. Um, you see lots of international comparisons of he headline rates of income tax, but they generally don't tell you what the social security taxes are either. So, uh, uh, so one of the things that would stop an individual country wanting to relabel them as income tax is that it will make their income taxes sound seem a lot higher relative to other countries than they did previously. Thank you. And uh, last issue, if I may, just uh, this is for, for Professor MacDonald, certainly in the first instance. You obviously in your paper talked about the vertical fiscal imbalance and indeed uh, other witnesses in, in previous weeks have done so as well. I'm just trying to get a handle on, is, is there a, obviously if a, if a country becomes an entirely uh, independent nation state, then you would say there's no vertical fiscal imbalance there. Is there a sort of universally agreed point short of that uh, which every economist, or at least a, a, a good number of them, will say there is no vertical fiscal imbalance. I mean, at, at what point on the on the scale is there a sort of agreed definition that there, there is no longer a vertical fiscal imbalance? Yeah, there's no there's no magic number here. Sure. Um, what most people do is is look at a simple scatter plot of, say, the OECD experience. Mm -hmm. If you do that, there's a cluster. Um, and then you, you'll see countries like Scotland as quite a big outlier. So it's really, I think, a question of moving somewhere into that cluster, but there, there's no kind of magic, uh, magic point. And I, I can't see, I mean, the way I did the calculations was um, kind of back of the envelope and, and, and probably should do them a slightly different way. But um, I don't think the, the VFI would ever come down to zero, for example. But... Um, all we can say at the moment is that Scotland is a big outlier in terms of developed countries, in terms of countries which have already got sub-central levels of devolution, and we need to get the figure more, uh, you know, the tax spend alignment more aligned. Sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. no, that's yeah. helpful. Uh, this, this comes back to a point that's already been raised. Um, I see OECD numbers 
about the proportion of subnational expenditure financed by subnational revenues. And you see that Germany gets a very high scoring of that. But it doesn't mean anything because almost every, almost all taxes, all, almost all taxes in Germany are determined by the federal government with the, with the lender having a significant influence through the Bundesrat, because generally speaking, uh, the, the federal government can't do things without support, of, without support in, the bun, in the Bundesrat. Um, so that the, the UK may be an outlier on those kind of numbers, but it just, just depends crucially about how you view assignment <coughs> rather than tax devolution in the sense you've got some, you've, you've got some kind of, some kind of uh, policy, some kind of policy control. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Convener, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, David Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, last week, uh, I think it was Professor McLean, was that right, we had uh, last week, and he, he talked about the best uh, taxes to devolve would be those linked to land, because the land can't move, and that would apply to buildings, land, and oil as well. So they were kind of top of his list and possibly inheritance tax thrown in. None of you have, I think, argued for that. Would you disagree with him? Uh, no, I wouldn't disagree. I think, I think that's a very good economic principle, that you, you tax assets uh, that are not movable. But I, I think given, the, um, given that we need a real movement here in the VFI, as we were saying, I think you've got to uh, start looking at the taxes of, of movable assets. And I think that's where I would be at the moment. Yeah. So, no, I wouldn't rule out taxing. So right. But you're saying kind of as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Right. I don't know if either of other... The, the, point, the point I would make on this is that one of the taxes, the two of the taxes that the, the Scottish Government already has is legislative control of council tax and business rates. Now, um, council tax has been frozen for seven years uh, and business uh, there hasn't been a domestic revaluation since the original council tax banding of 1991. And clearly, the 1991 bandings are pretty irrelevant in terms of what the change in relative property prices have been. Perhaps not so much in Scotland as in parts of, as in parts of England. Uh, but there is an important question about the willingness to actually take the political flack and actually and, and actually d deal with problems, uh, deal with the kind of maintenance system maintenance issues of, of particular taxes. Because if you don't deal with the system maintenance taxes, those taxes will will erode, at least in terms of, the, of their legitimacy. Um, the Public Accounts Committee conference that I mentioned earlier, uh, there was talk about the effect of business rates of online retail. So that the, one has to think, one has to be much more proactive, the Scottish Government needs to be much more proactive about the taxes, uh, the taxes that it does, that, that it does, con does control. I just briefly underline what Professor Heald has said, that we have three taxes already on land, which are council tax, business rates, and stamp duty land tax. And in all of them, we've pretty much reached the limits of what is politically possible already. So I don't think there's more money coming from there. The money okay. Be, yes, sorry. I wasn't suggesting there should be more money, mm -hmm. because that's, in a sense, one of the difficulties about council tax revaluation. Uh, that people think, well, the government will just get, get more money out of it. But my point is, the balance, the balance of what people pay has become illogical and indefensible, in, certainly in parts, of, in parts of England, because the banding system, because the revaluations haven't been revisited. Uh, the, uh, the Scottish Parliament uh, may remember the Burke Committee on Local Government Finance, uh, which... The, first, the then First Minister disowned the report uh, on the day of publication. Now, I'm quite aware of how politically sensitive such things are, but if you don't actually maintain the system, expect a loss of legitimacy of the system. Okay, the okay. Thing so, which is sorry, I mean, we're going on to maintaining the system. My point was, which, you know, what taxes should we actually have devolved? And, I mean, my question was about the land, whether it should be linked to land. So I think, I think we've probably covered that point, actually, if you'll excuse me. Thanks. Um, I mean, one of the ones that is linked to land is oil revenues, um, because the oil can't move. And the points made in some of the papers, I think Professor MacDonald, in um, page five of yours, that you know the UK effectively smooths that out. Um, could that same result be achieved by Scotland having a, an oil fund and effectively smoothing it out? So we save up in the good years and then use the money in the poorer years? 
Yes, potentially, but I think as we discussed during the referendum debate, it, it, I think it would be some time off before Scotland could do that. Uh, certainly in, in, in the, the sort of full fiscal autonomy model, it would be very difficult, I think, to do that in, in the near term. It's, it's certainly obviously something that's, that's possible in principle, but um, I think it, it does create additional problems in thinking about the devolution of, of extra powers because it introduces the importance of an asymmetric shock that if, if oil revenues were to be devolved, then uh, say, say the geographic share of oil revenues were to be devolved, then it would open Scotland to much more in the way of asymmetric shocks. And therefore, the whole idea that macro-stabilisation would come from the centre would be brought into question, I think. So, it, so, sorry, in short, in answer to your question, yes, in principle it's possible to have a uh, stabilisation fund. In practice, I can't see that being achieved in the near term. Um, and I think there will also be difficulties for micro-stabilisation of having potentially asymmetric movements in revenue there. So presumably, I mean, if, if the oil price was high to start with and we could actually save some of the money yeah. up, it would work, but it would be harder to do it if the oil price was low to start with. Well, it's going to have to be really high, though, isn't it, given, given what we know about the, the expenditure side of, of uh, Scotland's budget. It would need to be much, much higher than it is today and I think much higher by even... Uh, historical standards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, we've talked about uh, benefits and pensions quite a lot, and the, the word pooling came into, I think, several of your reports, uh, certainly in Professor MacDonald's. I mean, as I understand it, the, the, what Scotland spends is a share of uh, its GDP or tax revenue on uh, pensions and benefits is broadly similar to what the UK spends, and I believe is actually slightly less so, actually, there is no pooling in that area, so presumably it would be quite easy to, to split them. Is that, is that the case? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure about the technicalities of splitting, but whether you'd want to do that or not is, is a different issue, I think, because the, the pooling and risk-sharing comes through uh, common, say, con common unemployment benefits, for example. So, if the whole of the UK moves into a recession at the moment... Uh, if people in Scotland become unemployed, they, they go on to common unemployment benefits, which is a shared resource across the, the whole of the UK. Now, obviously, to buy into that system, you've got to put a shared amount into the centre. Um, so if you're talking about taking that out, then you would be thinking about uh, w what do you pay to the centre for other shared items such as macro-stabilisation, and it's not, not entirely clear to me that, um, you know, taking pensions and benefits out of the overall system would lead to a better, a better result, a better outcome. But, I mean, at the moment, what I'm, I suppose I'm asking is, you know, Scotland's not benefiting from this pooling and England's not benefiting from this pooling because they're both, they're both playing their own way. So, I mean, pooling's a kind of theoretical concept, but it's not actually happening at the moment, is it? Well, I think it is. I mean, if, as I say, if you've got a downturn in the Scottish economy, um, you're, you're basically, um, and say, you know, there's not a downturn in the rest of the UK, then right, the current right, system right. ensures that resources will flow to the UK, uh, sorry, to Scotland. to Scotland. If you break that link, then that, that, that's not going to happen, clearly. Okay. Is it, is it, but, Professor Kay, is that you? Right. But splitting isn't a nightmare in revenue and expenditure terms. It is, however, a nightmare in, in administrative terms. You know, and the splitting of pensions is something, again, it's one of these problems that if one had to solve, one would, but it's a very unpleasant administrative group of mm -hmm. administrative issues to face up to. Okay, and, and yes, previously you mentioned uh, about the costs of having a separate system, so I suppose that's what you're talking about again. I mean, do you think, but it's also been mentioned already today that the UK has an incredibly complex income tax system plus we're running this parallel income tax and national insurance. Do you think it would be possible for Scotland to have a much simpler system based on principles and, and to combine income tax and national insurance? Yes, it would. Uh, though, though one shouldn't exaggerate the extent to which one can have a simple income tax system. Income is just inherently a complex concept. I'm saying that because there are a lot of people who have ideas that 
you can have, as it were, income tax legislation defined on one or two sheets of paper, and you really can't. It doesn't have to be as many thousands of sheets of paper as it is, but it has to be quite a lot. Okay. Complex. Okay, I'll, I'll take that point on board. Uh, I mean, another point in relation to tax is that how, how different taxes are linked to each other, and the idea that income tax and capital gains tax are linked together. But I think it's also true that income tax and corporation tax are linked because people will incorporate or unincorporate depending how it suits them. Is that an argument for saying that it is better to have a bundle of taxes really that all tie together rather than just having one or two? Uh, okay. all right. I think there is such an argument. Uh, but actually, it would become a serious argument if the structure and base of income tax in Scotland were to be materially different uh, from that in England, then I think one would have to worry about the relationship between income tax and corporation tax as far as small businesses were concerned. Mm -hmm. But I think at the levels of a few points of difference, which I think is all we could realistically be talking about anyway, I don't think that there's a very large issue there. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? The, the, the UK had an issue in the 2000s because of the starting rate of corporation tax. And I was reading a kind of relatively old IFS uh, budget report, Green Budget, uh, which was making the point that there's been a very, a very significant rush to incorporations because of the starting rate of corporation tax. Yes. And interestingly, it didn't fall back to the pre-existing position when that starting rate was abolished. So I agree. The, the, if, if, if you're running a Scottish income tax, the relationship to corporation tax is a very significant issue to, issue to watch. Uh, that wouldn't persuade me to want to <coughs> devolve corporation tax, but certainly that is one of the kind of difficult interfaces. Mm -hmm. But that was just a very foolish policy, which one hopes no one will adopt again. <laughs> okay, thank you. If I can uh, ask, just one, touch on one other uh, subject which was, the, the, the comment was made earlier about possibly a race to the bottom, and especially on air passenger duty, uh, but I think inheritance tax was mentioned as well. Um, I think Professor Heald, you uh, mentioned that in your paper. I, I mean, I suppose with air passenger duty, the other argument is that actually the UK as a whole could get more tourists. It wouldn't just be more people coming to Scotland, less people going to England, but actually more people might come to the UK instead of France or Germany because it was more cheap to come here. Is that, is that an argument that's valid? I can see that, that there might be a diversion of, of traffic and some traffic generation. Uh, but, the, I mean, it's interesting, Northern Ireland has got partial uh, devolution of uh, air passenger duty, and there's actually one flight out of Belfast International Airport. Uh, and clearly that's not going to have significant effect on the rest of the UK. But say, for example, Scotland significantly reduced air, air passenger duty, it presumably it would have some effect on the North of England, North of England airports. So it's going to create internal political trouble within the UK. And I've no idea what the European Commission would say in terms of state aids. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things with tax, one of, one of the places that I would uh, not want to go is to too many disputes... Uh, with the European Commission and the European Court of Justice about what constitutes a state aid and what, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Although at the moment, tons of people go down to Manchester to fly from there, so, I mean, you can... Well, that, that's, that, yeah, but that, that, that relates to the kind of big significance of Manchester as a hub. Mm -hmm. OK, and finally, on the inheritance tax, I mean, the, the experience of land and building transaction tax is that we have made it more progressive, eh, and the land can't move, so hopefully we get more money from the richer and less from the poorer. Uh, do you not think inheritance, could inheritance tax be used in that way as well? Because most of the inheritance tax stuff would be fixed as well. I don't know if anyone's got a view on that. I would have, um, I'm by no means an inheritance tax expert, but my suspicion would be uh, that, that this would very quickly enter into the tax planning calculations. Uh, that, that if you had different rates of inheritance tax within the UK, uh, presumably dependent upon the person's, resi uh, person's residence, uh, there would be lots of uh, inheritance tax schemes sold. Uh, so, you know, I cannot see... It, it, if, if the question is, could Scotland raise more money by higher inheritance tax than the rest of the UK, I would be extremely dubious. I'd be much more likely to expect an attempt to attract high-income taxpayers, for example, into Wales, if Wales had this power, mm -hmm. uh, as a way of attracting their income tax 
now as well as their kind of future income inheritance tax. Okay. Professor Kidd, did you want to say something on that? All right. I just say I think inheritance tax liability is a slightly complicated mixture of where the property actually is and where the person who owns the property actually is. Yes. Uh, and this becomes quite a complicated group of issues. And I think the issue Professor Heald has mentioned of people actually, if, if this becomes devolved, it starts to be more attractive to lower tax in order artificially to induce people to uh, purport to be resident there uh, than it is to raise tax by making it more progressive. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. That's concluded questions from the committee and time is against us. But I just want to ask one point, and that's just to Professor MacDonald. You talk about an assignment of VAT at 50%. I'm just wondering why 50%, not 90%, or 20%, or why have you, or 100%? Why, have you, um, why do you think 50% would be appropriate? Um, I basically, as, as you saw in the, the calculations I did for the committee, um, I can't say they're definitive. Uh, I wouldn't say they're definitive. It was simply an illustrative exercise to show how we could um, get a, a VFI which was more respectable, more in line with other OECD countries. But as I say in, in the document, you could tweak the numbers in different directions, I think, to get uh, a balance which was mo perhaps more favourable to a particular position. I'm not particularly... Um, shall I say, hung up on the actual, the actual number there. Okay. Well, sorry, Professor Yield. I just wanted to come in that if you, devolve, if you have partial assignment of VAT, the question I want to ask, if VAT revenues go up significantly, is there adjustment to the block grant? And if VAT revenues go up significantly because of a UK tax policy change, uh, is, is there an increase in the block grant? So there's interaction. As soon as you start getting into assigned taxes, you have to start asking what the grant consequences of a UK change to that tax are. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm just wondering if there's any last points that any of our witnesses would like to, to make before we conclude. Okay, well, thank you very much, actually, for uh, very detailed uh, answers to our questions. Um, um, and you'll be glad to know, Professor Key, you're well in time for catching your train. Uh, I'm now going to call a short recess until um, 10 past 11 um, to allow an exchange of witnesses and an actual break for members.
folks. Uh, our next item of business today is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2015-16. Uh, welcome to the meeting, Barry White and Peter Ricky of the Scottish Futures Trust. Um, welcome back uh, to the committee. Uh, members have a, a copy of the paper from the Scottish Futures Trust. So we're going to go directly to questions. And as always, I'll uh, start off with the questions and then we'll um, open it up to uh, colleagues around the table. Um, first thing I want to say is... Um, very impressive that the Scottish Futures Trust has made £640 million of savings and benefits uh, and uh, supports 6,700 jobs. So congratulations on your successes in that regard. However, I do want to query some of the figures that you've actually uh, um, presented to us today. I noticed, for example, in your paper, in paragraph 1 in the introduction, you talk about £671 million of additional investment in 2014-15. Uh, but... Uh, when we actually look at the figures that are presented in page 164 of the budget, um, what we've seen is that uh, not only does that, do those figures not actually coincide with that figure, but also what we've seen is that uh, in terms of uh, this year, uh, what's been expected is a hundred, uh, over three year periods uh, to be spent is £195 million, pounds, actually less than was estimated only two years ago, £614 million. Uh, pounds as opposed to 809 million in these figures, although this uh, figure that's presented in your paper is, uh, is, uh, is um, a £57 million pound increase in that. So I'm just wondering if you can actually talk us through these figures, because you, you'll recall from our uh, report last year that uh, the committee commented on the significant overestimation of the delivery of NPD projects in specific years, and once again we appear to have a situation whereby we've got an overestimation. Good morning, uh, convener and, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here um, today. Um, maybe just before I respond to that particular question, it's probably just worth registering with the committee that on the M8 project, which is part of the NPD programme, um, I'm actually a director of that company, and I just think it's a, a courtesy just to make sure the committee are aware of that. And um, I'm what's called the public interest director, mm -hmm. which is the part of the NPD structure where the public interest director um, protects surpluses and the profit capping nature of, of, of that. But I think just for absolute transparency, so it, I am officially a director in, com in a company's house term of, of that company. So when it comes to any matters of detail around the M8, I might ask Peter to talk about those rather than, than, than me. But I think that's just something I would like to register first of all. Um, mm -hmm. The £671 million, pounds, like obviously... NPD is one of the things Scottish Future Trust does. We do many other things. Um, and in coming, so for instance, we work on the low carbon and energy efficiency sides. We work with local authorities. We've worked with them to quadruple investment in street lighting. So in the paper to the committee, um, what we did was take the um, NPD investment um, and add on to that in terms of total additional investment um, what we do in the National Housing Trust and what we do in things like tax incremental financing and the Growth Accelerator model. Um, the Growth Accelerator model is a recent innovation which um, is launching a very major investment in, into Edinburgh where um, Henderson Real Estate on the back of the Growth Accelerator model are going to invest some £400 million um, into the centre of Edinburgh. So in looking at additional investment as a whole, um, what we have said is, in addition to the NPD money, which is as the figure is in the budget, there is National Housing Trust investment where we're buying houses out in the market, and there's also um, TIF and Growth Accelerator model investment. So what we did give was the total additional investment figure over and above NPD, whereas in the budget it's purely an NPD figure. Okay, I, I, I didn't pick that up, and the reason I didn't pick that up was because... Um, I thought there'd actually just been a, a change since the draft budget had actually been published and also because the figures actually, for example, in terms of the uh, National Housing Trust, uh, when you talk about the year's concern, for example, 15, six, uh, 16 and £42 million, pounds, I should uh, perhaps have uh, thought that well, there was a £57 million pound gap, so maybe that's £42 million, maybe TIF is 15, but I maybe didn't actually go through these figures, so apologies for that. But I'm just wondering, um, on the broader point, though, that I was making... Um, 
about the fact that uh, your estimates are still considerably lower than they have been. And each year, we, we, there seems to be this issue of overestimation of, of budgets. And I notice, for example, you've talked about, under schools, for example, you talk about inability to proceed on common good land, outturn of statutory consultation processes, land acquisition, ground conditions. So I do realise there are things that actually come up which prevent delivery of such projects. But why is it that year on year we still have this uh, overestimation? Because, I mean, we know every year that there's always a kind of issue mm. about potential delays in projects. Mm. I mean, we've all experienced that in our own constituencies, but it still doesn't tell me why. It's, it's never the other way. It's never like, oh, well, actually, we thought it'd be, you know, I don't know, 809 million. It was actually 900 million. Mm. You know, you do seem very cautious in your estimates. Well, um, the estimate for Last year, we did actually exceed by 21 million. So there is, there is movement both ways. So what we say is the movement this year in, um, is something like 142 million from what we said last year, but 20 million moved forward and something like 89 million moved back. So the actual overall difference over three years um, is something in the order of just over 30 million, which is 2% across a programme um, you know, 2% across a total of some, um, figure, 1.7 billion. So, um, and what we have done for the committee this year is set out um, two things. We set out a very clear table saying what the main reasons for that movement was uh, and what we are um, very keen on is we do push for pace and we're continuing to achieve financial clues as well ahead of historic norms. So the average um, procurement starting to financial clues time across HUB and the NPD programme, which is how these projects are being procured, is still around 17 months. The historic norm published by the Treasury is something on the order of 34, 35 months. So we are making rapid progress. And actually, I think our ambition for the programme has helped make that progress happen. So um, what we have done though this year, and that's the second point I'd like to make, is um, in looking at the forecast for 1516, which is the, the budget scrutiny currently being done, we actually have taken on board what the committee said last year, and we have added 100 million of um, contingency to that number. So the current profile of work suggests that for 1516, the estimate could be 100 million higher than what we've said, and taking on board what the committee said, we've, we've taken 100 million off that. Uh, so um, to provide, or, or just to reflect that, that we've always said there's been uncertainty, and we've reflect, reflected that now by, by adding that contingency in. Okay, I'm sure colleagues will want to explore this a wee bit further, but. Um, you know, in, in your letter um, based to John Swinney, you basically say, and I quote, that the £1 billion programme extension will benefit from the lessons learned in delivering the current projects, and we are currently putting together detailed implementation plans. I just wonder if you can talk us through what, what those lessons are that have been learned. Yeah, I mean, we always learn lessons as we go along. We're, less, we're learning them within the current programme, and we learn them for the future programmes as well. And... The first lesson, I suppose, in there is to say that it's really important for the construction and other industries that they know which projects are coming up and when they're coming so that they can plan their resources um, accordingly and that they can um, build up and get the right skills in place at the right time. So we will continue to let the industry know as early as we can uh, what's coming. What we also know is that this... Uh, profile that we've given to you here is an estimate of future workload. It is not a budget. So it's, it's probably a lesson that for the industry and for all those concerned, when that happens is less important than that the projects are coming and broadly that they need to resource up for them. So we will publish detailed information on individual projects at the right time for those individual projects. We'll seek corporate commitment on project timescales and resourcing from the individual bodies that are running procurements. And that's an important principle for us across the programme is that on individual projects, there is accountability rests with the procuring body for those individual projects. 
and we want to strengthen the commitment of those individual bodies um, to, to delivery and to getting the right resources in place to deliver those projects. Um, we've got a series of detailed lessons that have been shared across the, the programme already and they're available on our, on our website and, and that goes into all sorts of um, commercial and practical details about how to specify buildings so that we get what we want and how we should commercially pay for those buildings through the, the payment mechanism, which is quite a detailed formula that we're spreading best practice across the public sector so that we can drive down transaction costs for both the public and the private sectors in doing these deals, and we will continue to learn those lessons. We will have a, a focus on getting the right projects and the right deal, and I think that that's shown by the fact that in the Hub programme, for example, there's a less than 0.5% cost growth between the outline business case stage and the um, construction completion for the projects that have been completed. And from contract award to construction completion, across the programme, we see zero cost growth. So con continuing to learn that lesson that we get um, the right projects and do the right deal by getting experienced individuals in locally accountable project teams to do the deals is is exactly what we'll do over that um, program, program extension. Well, I think that is impressive indeed, but uh, I'm, I'm just, I would take issue with one thing you said, which was that uh, when it happens is not important. I think it, it probably actually is for the people who are awaiting such projects. But I'm, I wonder if I can switch uh, over to uh, National Housing Trust, um, uh, which um, as you said in your paper is a joint venture between SFT private developers and local authorities allowing affordable housing to be developed without Scottish Government grant subsidy. And I noticed in the figures actually that you have provided, um, there's, this, there seems to be, in, in terms of um, programme handed over, there seems to be a year-on-year -year decline in that from 398 to 325 to 277 uh, going into next year. But also, when looking at the capital value of that, it seems to average out at about £150,000 per unit, which seems quite expensive for uh, an affordable home. How big are these homes? Um, there are a variety of sizes, and um, so I think two bedroom or three bedroom would be sort of the most popular size within that. Okay. Um, but these are homes that are being built without grant subsidies, so there's no offsetting of any sort of 25 or 45,000 pounds grant, as might be the case in, in other areas. Um, and actually, generally, these homes are in um, the eastern side of Scotland, so they are in actually the hotter housing market. So a lot of them have been in Aberdeen, um, a lot have been in Edinburgh, and these are um, houses being bought at sort of market rates and we're using a government guarantee to get cheaper loans in in a partnership that has allowed them to be rented in the mid-market rent sector without government grants. So, and, and there's also a wider benefit for the National Housing Trust for the residents is not only are they getting a below market rent, um, but quite often their energy costs come down considerably as well. Uh, and in addition to that, they have a very professional landlord service. So the demand for these homes has been um, very significant, actually, and um, we are looking at ways of doing more mid-market rent, which I think we view very much as in addition to the government's other housing programmes in terms mm -hmm. of social and council house building, uh, and we see this as an additional way of bringing in more housing supply, which I think is a critical challenge we face as a country. But why are the numbers going down from 398 to 277 over a couple of years? Um, the numbers... Um, really flow off the back of a series of procurements. So we have procured a number of phases and as houses are then handed over, as they're built out, um, so we've launched a further procurement with the City of Edinburgh Council for five or for up to 500 further homes. So you'll actually see those numbers starting to go up again in future years uh, as the outcome of that procurement uh, comes around. But it's a phased procurement and as we get blocks handed over, so it, it, it is very much... Um, part of the success that so much has happened already. And because it's not grant funded, it's not, um, it's dependent on the market and market conditions rather than grant funding. So um, it really just follows the profile set by the developers when their developments are being built out, really. Okay, thank you. 
Now, in, um, in page uh, three of your report, you say 21% of UK construction contracts and 53% of infrastructure contracts awarded uh, were in Scotland um, in the uh, most recent October 2014 industry statistics. But um, I mean, that sounds incredibly uh, impressive. But uh, what's the average size of these contracts compared to the average in the UK? Um, what the um, table and diagram on page three of the report show, the first table shows that construction GDP growth over the past 18 months in Scotland uh, has been 9% compared to 7.6% in the rest of the UK. And if you stripped London out of the rest of the UK figures, you'd see just how much on a regional basis the uh, construction mar uh, GDP has grown in Scotland. We don't actually have the separate London figures, but we know that London is a real, a really vibrant construction area. The diagram by Barber ABI, and Barber ABI are a very well-respected monitor of construction workflow. Mm -hmm. They actually published the UK government's construction pipeline, for instance. Um, what that monitors is a percentage of the total orders placed in a month. Uh, so that's what those percentages are. So in June, for instance, they reported that half of all healthcare, public health care orders in the UK were placed in Scotland. Um, and what we've shown is the most recent data, which is, I think, September data, uh, uh, which was published in October. And what that's actually showing is that in September this year, compared to September last year, there's been a lot of growth in Scotland, 34% more this year compared to last year. Um, but also that the figures you've quoted in terms of the 21% uh, and the 53%, that is the total of the UK orders of that type that they have monitored. So it's a percentage of the whole UK market uh, orders. I don't know what that. I don't know what the total UK market order figure is. But I'm just wondering what it is in, in cash terms because you know one contract could be worth 100,000 pound. It could be worth 10 million pounds. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know that it means a lot that particular figure in itself. To be honest, you know. I think what, what it shows is, and, and this is really saying, um, what, it, what it really shows is that the GDP figures show that this construction industry in Scotland has had strong growth over the last 18 months. What this chart shows is that the forward order book is looking strong as well. So in terms of the outlook for the industry, and that's where I think some of the quotes from people like um, Alan Watt from the Civil Engineering Contractors Association um, the core message on workload is pretty heartening, not only for work in progress, but important with a very good future outlook as well, um, expressing some concerns about skills, though, after that. And I think skills is an issue that is concerning um, all of the industry at the moment. So really what this chart shows is that the, S the Scottish order book is a strong order book, and that gives industry confidence to recruit. And this is a really important part of it, and that's why the £1 billion extension to the NPD pipeline is so important because it's sending industry a signal that this workflow that's here today, the orders that are seeing coming through, and the future workload actually means that Scotland is a place where actually investing in recruitment and investing in skills is a good place to do so. Okay, thank you for that. Just one final question, then I'll open up the session to colleagues, and that's on the issue of borrowing, which, uh, as I said to you in the kind of interval, I did actually raise uh, with the previous panel of witnesses. Mm -hmm. And it's just um, to ask what uh, discussions you've had with the, the Scottish Government in terms of uh, the planned use of capital borrowing as we go forward. Peter Dayton. Well, the, the use of um, capital budgets and the prioritisation of investments, we've always said, is a, is a matter for... The Scottish Government and we are implementers so we've looked at the implementation of the future MPD program and the billion pound extension of that and we're in discussion with officials all the time um, about that and how it will um, the lessons that we've learned etc etc so at a, at a detailed level on the MPD program and that form of revenue funded investment we have discussions on a very regular basis on that but the overall the way that investment is split and what comes out of capital budgets and what is delivered through MPD is generally about which projects are better suited to individual styles of of investment and we've always said that the MPD 
and the revenue funded projects are better off suited for the, the larger scale investments um, and that's what we've, we're continuing through the billion pound extension that we've, that we've just talked about. Okay. Right. Um, the first colleague to ask questions will be Jamie to be followed by Michael. It, thanks. Uh, can we, um, you mentioned the 6,700 jobs that are being supported across the country. That's obviously very significant for uh, Scotland as a whole. I'm just wondering if these figures can be broken down by uh, project. I'm not necessarily asking for you to detail all that here now, if you have any uh, examples that might be useful, because I'm just thinking that that might be more meaningful to, to local communities if you can say, well, this project's actually delivering X amount of, of jobs. Is that something that you can provide to the committee? Um, I think the 6,700 comes from the general metric that the government applies, which is, I think, Peter, I'm right in saying, is a... a 10 to a million. 10 to... So, so the 671 million transit to 6,700 jobs, mm -hmm. but I don't think we could, you know, it is using the government uh, figures that says actually for X expenditure you get X, you get Y jobs, so in some ways we could allocate it out against projects, but it would mm -hmm. simply be on a formulaic basis. Okay. I think, you know, the, the, that's at a programme level when you're doing this, it's very much uh, um, using that um, overall approach rather than building it up from specific projects. Okay. That's actually quite useful clarity. Okay. Um, you say that the uh, NP Infrastructure Investment Programme remains one of the largest of its type in Europe. Can you give us uh, some comparisons? Um, we, across um, Europe, um, the Dutch government have a very big programme and the French government did have a very big programme. Um, the IMF... Um, according to David Smith in the Sunday Times, concerned about the slowdown in the Eurozone's growth has called for more debt finance infrastructure spending. Um, but what, what I could provide to the committee is an update to the evidence we gave, um, I think, maybe one or two years ago in terms of the sort of relative scale um, of, of other areas. But we know from the European PPP Expertise Centre that publishes statistics on what individual countries are doing that um, what we're doing in Scotland is, 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 is one of the biggest on a per head basis, obviously, uh, across, uh, across Europe. Um, so I think there was a very major announcement by the so President Juncker coming in of uh, a great desire. Was it 300 billion, Peter? So the challenge being set by the incoming President of the European Union is can we do more infrastructure investment involving both public and private uh, investment. So we're probably interested to see whether Europe starts to step up both in the IMF and also from the challenge being set by um, President Juncker coming in. But if you could provide the, the detail you, you suggest you can, that, that, that would probably be quite helpful. And, and a related point in your paper, you say Scotland's infrastructure activity has written, risen by 34.4% when compared with September 2013. And you offer some comparative figures for the regions of uh, England and uh, Wales, and it's uh, considerably uh, larger. I think the next uh, largest uh, increase is the south east of England, which is up by 3.1 per cent. The east of England is down by 12.4, and London's down by 9.5. That's quite a disparity. Can you you say why this is the case? Um, I, I think to, to, to be fair, to the, you know, in, in all these things, it's about trends rather than about absolutes, and actually. Um, you know, it could have been in last September, London had a very active month, so therefore it going down 9% is, still means there could be quite a lot of orders play. So, but I think what it does show is both in the GDP growth figures, which is looking back the way and looking forward the way that um, the impact of the investment plans is very considerable. And the, what the budget shows for 15-16 is something like 4.5 billion of investment planned from a capital budget of about 2.7 billion. So I think what we're seeing in Scotland is a really sort of strong commitment, uh, in addition to capital budgets, to, to invest heavily. And I think what that is flowing through to is the sort of orders figures we're seeing. Um, I don't believe the rest of the UK is doing the same additional investment of, of the type we're doing in NPD. The Welsh Government is looking at starting to do some NPD programmes, and we know Northern Ireland's talking about it. 
Um, England has a, a priority schools building program, um, but in relative scale is, is, is relatively small. So what we are doing in Scotland is using the powers we have, and we know more powers are coming in terms of borrowing. We've submitted our own views to the Smith Commission on borrowing powers where we believe there's a slight inconsistency in the current borrowing powers in that our projection for next year is that NPD could provide about 900, or more than 900 million of investment, whereas borrowing powers would only allow us to do 300 million of investment. And our argument would be saying, actually, um, both of those have to be paid out of the same pot of money in terms of the repayments, and therefore having the flexibility to choose whether to do NPD or to do, to, to do borrowing seems to us to be um, a sensible choice for, the, for, for Scotland to have. Just turning back to the issue the convener touched on, the uh, National Housing Trust, and you've already talked about the, the reason for the change in the, the number of homes uh, each uh, year, but just to bottom that out, you don't have an actual target in terms of uh, delivery of number of homes through this, do, do you? I think probably um, we set ourselves a target that started doing 1,000, so that was what we had said, we'll do 1,000 homes. That was, um, a, that was a cumulative target? A cumulative right? target, yes. Um, and, and actually, the National Housing Trust um, partly responded to the time in which... It, so we started working the National Housing Trust, developing the idea in, in 2009. It was relatively untested. Uh, it was totally untested, actually, a totally innovative idea. Um, and took that through. While we we're working up the concept, um, Treasury added a levy to the Public Works Loans Board, so the interest rate went up from a working assumption of 3% to 4% almost overnight for the type of money we'd be borrowing, which would be five to ten year money. So it, th there were a raft of things happened, um, a number of challenges overcome, but, but the National Housing Trust was responding in part to the downturn in the housing market. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of the hidden benefits of the National Housing Trust is in Dundee, for instance, where the National Housing Trust is buying 99 units from a developer. It has allowed that developer to open up a whole site for 200 units. The other 101 will be sold privately or rented to the private market. Mm -hmm. So it was aimed partly at providing more affordable rent homes, but also at actually helping you know, stimulate development overall and un unlocking sites that were otherwise going to sit mothballed. And if you go to a bank with a pre-purchase agreement or an agreed purchase agreement for 99 homes, they're much more willing to lend you money to develop the infrastructure of a site. So the National Housing Trust, I think, in its current form, will probably run one or two more phases. Perhaps the phase with Edinburgh might be its last phase. We will have to continue to innovate and do different way, find different ways of doing housing. So that's a challenge that we're taking on. But the National Housing Trust, we've learnt a lot through that that can be applied to future ways of doing affordable housing as well. Uh, you sort of preempted my, my question there, my next follow-up question. So, so it was devised as a response to the downturn in the housing market, but as the housing market recovers, you still see a role for the, the National Housing Trust, but it might just have to develop and innovate and do different things then? I think the times in which we... Um, are working in mean that the concept of developing one way of doing things and sticking with it forever is actually not going to be um, a likely outcome. So I think what we have to do is be nimble and be willing to adapt and change. And, and, and you can see with the National Housing Trust, we started doing it in joint venture with um, private sector developers. We've actually now branched out into doing it in a sort of partnership joint venture with local authorities, um, what we will continue to do is look at new ways. So I think given changing economic circumstances, changes in the house building market, we will have to change and adapt, and that's absolutely right, and that's a challenge we, we actually welcome. Um, but I think the underlying issue is we need more homes built, and that's the challenge that um, we're looking at to say how can we find, whether that be private rental sector, whether it be whether that be affordable. So I think that's the, the, the challenge that's there, and we, we need to find more ways of doing it. And the National Housing Trust has been a fantastic way of doing it, but perhaps will not be that in its current form uh, the way we do it in the future. You, you, I mean, the bottom line is, as you've just said, we need more homes built, and you've made the point that it's been quite focused on a few specific uh, areas of the country. It seems to be rolling out to others. Can we see this being rolled out 
elsewhere can I look forward to this support and houses being built in my constituency and coming along close eyes? Um, well, we, we, <laughs> not necessarily <laughs> absolute come out for my constituency. <laughs> <laughs> but you take the point, can it, will it be rolled out elsewhere? Well, Although feel free to commit to building yes. houses. Um, <laughs> Naturally, we, we offered it to everyone. So we offered every local authority the chance to be part of it. Some grabbed it and were willing to move forward quickly. And we moved forward with those that were willing and able to do so. And that means Dumfries and Galloway, it means Inverness, um, it means Falkirk, Stirling, um, Dundee, as well as that. You know, so it is quite a wide, it's a, it is a widespread initiative. Mm. Um, but what we actually need is partners who are willing to move quickly and be nimble. And wherever they are, we will work with them. So there's, there's, no, there's no barrier set by us. Okay. I, th I, th I think um, uh, I read the message there and I'll take that <laughs> away. That's, that's me, Convener. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Michael, before by Gavin. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, again, it's going back to the issue of, of borrowing. And I, I don't know if you can answer this question, but I'm asking if you might be able to help us in, in understanding the way that the budget might uh, pan out. The, the, the Scottish Government's uh, budget for 2015-16 uh, sets out the three options that are available in terms of borrowing. They are the, the National Loans Fund, the banks on commercial terms or by issuing bonds. Now, the Scottish Government has said that in due course we'll learn which of those methods or combination of those methods um, that borrowing of £304 million is going to take. But have you had any discussions with the Scottish Government about what would be most attractive to the, the, the financial sector that you're dealing with in order to get these projects that are going to benefit from this borrowing moving forward? Uh, as, as speedily as possible. Peter Jones. I mean, we obviously get market feedback on a reasonably frequent basis because we're dealing with banks and financial institutions on on project finance deals through the, um, the MPD and uh, hub programmes at the at the minute. As for under Scottish government borrowing, exactly which route that will take, I'm sure that will be a decision taken in in due course, depending on and a detailed assessment made at the time. Um, we know with the NPD and with HUB that there's a, a wide variety of factors to be taken into account when you're selecting both who to borrow from and what structure to, to come down. And, and one of those is the absolute price of funds from any given route at, at any given point in time. One of them, another one, however, for example, is the repayment profile and in MPD and hub we have a, a structure whereby we start to repay our financing when the buildings are occupied so here we have um, all the additionality of investment that we've talked about um, already today the unitary charges or the repayments for that start when the buildings are occupied not immediately as soon as the borrowing is done. So that's another factor that's important, is how the repayments are done, and they're fully repaid over a 25-year life of the building. So I would say that, and I'm sure that a detailed assessment is going to be necessary on not just the cost of finance at any point in time, but other factors, how quickly borrowing can occur, and the repayment profiles and the flexibility over that uh, as well. Yeah, so in essence, what you're saying is we, we can't expect a date in which the government is going to announce £304 million through this method for these projects. Is, is that unlikely? In fact, maybe, I think the great flexibility that borrowing gives you, and that's one of the reasons we put in our Smith Commission about borrowing powers, is you don't have to choose the projects, and, and you can almost... You can choose to use the money and then borrow to fund the projects, whereas... With NPD, you have, to attach, think, you have to attach the financing and the project at an early stage. So the flexibility of borrowing powers is you can, in effect, use it to increase your capital budget. So if the capital budget, I think, from the UK government is 2.7 billion, and you can borrow 300 million on top of that, you can, in effect, express your capital budget as the total of those two things. So that's, you know, so, um, or you could actually choose to say, no, we're going to use the borrowing powers to fund a particular program and earmark it against a particular program, and then you profile your borrowing powers against it. I think that's a choice, um, really, the government would have to make in terms of 
do you want to actually, and all the countries, uh, if they're borrowing to invest, um, set up funds like the Building Australia Fund or the Building America Fund that says actually you want to be very clear that this is borrowing for investment and you actually are market as a fund and, and, and sort of publish that, the details around that separately. You don't have to do that with borrowing powers. So I think our view on borrowing powers is they're a very flexible tool um, in terms of um, what you do and how you do it. So you could borrow, for instance, and decide to use that on, on, on anything that you normally use your capital budget for. So that flexibility is one of the big benefits of borrowing powers. Yeah, I mean, I understand the benefits of the borrowing mm. powers, but you know, there's a downside of still got to be paid back at oh, some point. Uh, um, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which we're, we're very... St we, 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 we're <laughs> um, but, you know, in, in terms of looking at this budget, which is what we're doing, we're scrutinising mm -hmm. the, the Scottish Government's budget, it's not clear how the borrowing is going to be used. Mm. That's, that's the point. I mean, we know that there are three options available um, to access that borrowing. What I'm trying to establish is, are we, can we expect an announcement which will say, here is how much we're going to borrow, we know it's going to be the maximum, here is how we're going to do it, and here are what those pro projects are going to be. Or ca can we expect, as we move throughout the financial year, to see changes in how we borrow, additions to the projects that are uh, being borrowed against? Is that the more likely scenario rather than a big bang announcement of X amount of borrowing, X amount of projects, and done in a particular way? I really think that's a question for, for all, you know, I, I, that's not something that's in my gift to answer. And I think we can help the government with the technicalities of borrowing and whether you adopt a bullet repayment or whether you adopt a, 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 a repayment profile, whether you go 10 years, whether you go 25 years, that's sort of our expertise and that's where we can add a lot of value in speaking to the market. We know what markets, uh, and that's... that's by the way, this is actually a great time for f financing projects. We're getting really attractive rates on, on, on the projects we're, we're, we're financing. So, but, but in essence, the question you're asking, I'm, I'm afraid we really can't answer. That's something I think that, that perhaps others would be better placed to answer than us. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I can't. No, that's right. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gavin, to be followed by John. Um, on uh, page two of your uh, report, um, it's item four, investment for growth, and it's really about tax incremental financing. Um, you've obviously given us some helpful statistics there. Um, the programme for TIF is forecast to deliver up to 261 million in public sector investment over the period from 1314 to 2324. Um, is it possible to get, maybe in writing a breakdown of what you think the profile of that expenditure is likely to be, or, or at least at this stage, are you able to say, look, it's going to be fairly light in the early years and it's, it's going to mainly be loaded towards 23-24, or is it more front-loaded, or, or is it spread evenly? Do you, do you have a, any sense of the kind of profile of spend um, for, the, for the TIF projects? Yeah. Um, the overall level of public sector investment is calculated at a high level based on the enabling projects that the different local authorities involved in the TIF projects believe that they will have to deliver. The timing when each of those projects will be delivered will be subject to individual decisions made within each of the governance arrangements for the, the TIF areas. So we're not able at this stage to say that that individual project with that budget associated with it will be delivered um, at... at a given stage over that programme duration, which is intended to be the, the full enabling period that, that TIF um, supports. So it's, it's difficult to be specific then, I suppose, is, is what you're saying. On, on that, though, I mean, f fair enough, except that you're coming to us in a year's time, say, for example, for the, as part of the budget process and, and you're reporting back. What are, what are the sort of likely expenditure on TIF for 14-15 likely to be? I mean, is, is it any... Uh, you're saying it's hard to project too far in the future. Is, is it a kind of rough projection of what you think will happen in uh, the current financial year? Is it the nine, is it, is it the nine million? Right, okay. Out in, 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 the, in paragraph, well, the second paragraph under heading four. So we estimate that's, that's what the likely public spend right. will be. But what I'd really like to come back and talk about is actually what 
private sector sure. doing as a result of the sort you know because I think there's a multiplier effect between what we're doing in the public sector so uh, you know, things like the St James Quarter investment through the, the uh, agreement with Edinburgh um, I think for us the biggest prize there is not the public sector investment but what we can actually invest in an area that actually allows or unlocks uh, private sector investment. Okay. Well, let, let, let's come to, to private sector investment then in that case. The, I mean, you've said again at the end of that paragraph, private, private sector investment of around five times this amount, uh, $1.3 is anticipated to be leveraged. Is, is that $1.3 or, or the five times multiple... Is that a best case scenario? Is that a central scenario? Is that a cautious estimate? What, how, how likely is the 1.3 billion? Uh, how likely is that to actually happen? What's your central? Well, one of the great things about TIF and the growth accelerator and all these economic investment approaches is that it requires local authorities to put forward business cases that are absolutely true business cases because. What TIF does is it allows them to borrow in the belief that their business case is right. So they are forecasting that um, on the back of the TIF in Glasgow, for example, that private sector investment will flow and therefore there will be an increase in non-domestic rates. And after allowing for displacement, they can keep the non-domestic rates. So what we're actually finding is when people do business cases in TIF, they really think about them because they're actually taking a risk that their forecasts are right. So when they are doing their forecasts, the, uh, the business case regime around that means that if they're over-optimistic in their forecasts, then the um, financial cost of that investment will fall back on the local authority. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we, we believe the forecasts are reasonably prudent. So they're not, they're not necessarily best case, worst case, but they, the nature of that type of investment means that people have to... It, it's not a business case that actually promotes um, overstatement because of that, otherwise they'd be taking risk back internally. And I think that's why in some cases some of the, the TIF business cases actually, um, if, if you'd ask people to submit a business case simply applying for a grant, people would normally turn that round incredibly quickly because they will put a business case forward to win their slice of the, the pie. What the TIF regime does is actually a really interesting alignment. It means people have to genuinely believe what they're putting forward um, and because they are taking a risk on what their predictions are. Okay, and on the, I mean, you talked about displacement there. On, on displacement, do, do the individual local authorities make assumptions about that, or do they get input from you, or do you have control over that? Who, who sort of decides, in a business case, how much displacement is there likely to be? Is there a kind of standard approach? There's not a standard approach because the, the nature will change, whether it's hotels, commercial, um, re retail... Um, so it's an individual assessment. The local authority will propose a, a, a displacement rate. We will assess it along with government, and at the end of the process, it's an agreed displacement rate. So it, it's not it's not a formulaic approach. It, it, there's a matter of judgment in it. So, so if, if they were being over optimistic about displacement, you you could or you might say to them, look. We think you need to. We have discussions along yeah, those sure. lines. Yeah, okay. no, I, won't ask you for, I won't ask you for specifics. But yeah, you do. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, can we come on to uh, NPD then, um, which is obviously in your uh, report as well? Um, in terms of the, it's really starting. It's a letter that you wrote to John Swinney on the seventh of October, which came with the papers, uh, came with your submission. The the thirteen fourteen figure in that table in the letter, 177, you say 177 actual. Is, is that, I mean, now, uh, is the accounting done? It's not a sort of best guessed actual. Is, is that the final final figure, as it were? Or, or what's the status of that figure? Um, Peter, do you want to...? Yeah, that um, is the figure based on all of the profiles that are now contracted mm. of um, the activity that... Uh, has taken place in in the year thirteen fourteen, yeah. Okay. Um, in, in terms of the fourteen fifteen figure in that same table, that's that's six hundred and fourteen. If you do a sort of comparison, taking out the M eight savings, it was seven five seven uh, a year ago. Um, the changes appear to be schools, colleges, and community health. They seem to be the sort of the three where there have been the biggest changes. 
Can, can you talk us through um, the changes to each of those three, schools, colleges and uh, community health? Certainly, I think um, we set out largely around community health and schools. Peter, do you want to talk about the, about the differences? I mean, I, there are, as we put in the, in the letter, a number of areas, principally in, in schools and community health, as Barry said, and there are different um, classes of, of those movements. And in schools, first of all, there have been a number of projects where it hasn't been possible to proceed with a project um, as it was scoped um, originally. And it's maybe better to talk about that by way of example. And the Barhead project is, is possibly a, a good example where the school was announced in September 2012 as part of the Phase 3 of the Scotland Schools for the Future programme. And East Renfrewshire Council at that stage anticipated that that project could be on site in 12 to 18 months of that announcement. And the design was developed pretty rapidly um, through uh, HUB based on the, the successful project at Eastwood. And that project was just about ready for financial close in, in the spring of 2014 when and all the way through that development, the council had a preferred site in mind and that, that preferred site was on common good land. In parallel with the project development, the, the council was doing diligence on its ability um, to build on that uh, site. And unfortunately, after taking that through legal process and rights um, to the court of session in the end, they were told that they weren't able to build on that site. And that has led to uh, the project being put on hold for around about nine months. And only now are we, um, as the council just about selected uh, uh, another site, and we'll have to go through an element of redesign to make the, the, the work that they had suitable for the new site and um, to proceed on that basis. So there are some pretty binary points in, um, that, that happen as you go through projects. And there are other examples where... Um, statutory consultations that councils expected um, to get through were not supported, so they've had to, to change their plans. So that's a, a, a class, if you like, of things that have happened on individual projects. We, we are very supportive of local authorities and other procuring bodies across Scotland buying the right thing. It's really important that we both buy the right thing and get the right deal for those things. So the, the second... Um, class of issues that we referred to in our letter on, on schools has been where we have had to take time on individual projects to get the right deal um, for that project. And that might be to do the right commercial deal with a contractor. It might be to make sure that we have the right contract in place for the life cycle maintenance of that building as well, because we're not only interested in putting up the right buildings, we're interested in them being looked after for 25 years. And we will always support authorities and indeed ourselves will occasionally hold back projects through our key stage review process where we don't think that that deal is right for the longer term. So in schools, it's principally getting the right project um, and getting the right deal. In the community health sector, which is the other area that we've put in our submission, again, there have been some delays. It's a pretty quickly changing time in the deliver delivery of, of health and social care, as you know. And what we've seen in that area is that the evolving integration agenda has caused a number of projects to, to pause again to think about whether that's the right project for the long term and to rescope a project to include, in many cases, more involvement of local authorities, so integrating health and care services. And that integration... First of all, as you can imagine, there is a redesign of a facility to, to include more services. The other parts that come with that is often an opportunity for the reciting of a service um, and a facility that might be now sited on land that was in council ownership rather than in health board ownership. And reciting can lead to redesign. And it also means that projects face scrutiny and affordability considerations and value for money considerations from two bodies at the same time, the local authority and the health board. And 
that parallel processing of, of projects through developments in governance often takes longer, well, generally takes longer than if there's only one body concerned. We still believe that these will be the right projects um, for, for that extra work that's been done and for bringing bodies together to procure. Bringing bodies together is a tricky thing to do, but it is absolutely right for those projects. So across the schools area and the um, health community projects, those are the, the main features that have caused projects as we reported. And as we've always said, there are uncertainties. Those are the things that have happened um, to cause that movement. Okay. And last question, if I may, Convener. Just the, you've obviously then put a sort of prediction, as it were, for 2015-16, which is uh, 954 million. Um, now, you said, I think, in, in response to the Convener, that you've, you've effectively got a float, if you like, um, or some leeway of about 100 million in there. You, you, your central guess is you might actually end up doing more than that. So you, I think you're saying you're trying to be cautious there. Clearly, there will be some factors out with your control and, and some of the uh, issues you've just described could, I suppose, conceivably happen in 15-16 as well. Um, but is, is it your central scenario that for 2015-16 it, it will be 950, 954 million? Is, is it unlikely to be less than that? I think what we've done is taken a prudent contingency but I think we would always caution that when you're dealing with international financing markets, um, you know, the source of finance we're getting at the moment is coming from literally all around the world. Um, and we welcome that because actually we're getting great deals on, 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 on financing. So we actually believe, taking into account what the committee said last year, I think the continuum is very helpful in adding certainty. But I think we'd always say we still require projects to be done. And picking up... I think point convener you made earlier, um, we do care enormously about when things happen. So you know, but there is a danger in projects when the timing becomes the overriding factor, and there is a whole history of public sector projects where a project team has been set a deadline to meet, and I think that then actually forces people to make decisions that aren't good long-term decisions. And therefore, while we push for time, we push for pace, absolutely, and we want to see things happening as quickly as possible, what we won't do is get ourselves into a position where we actually end up with those wrong decisions being forced by a deadline. And it would be wrong of me to list projects that history shows where that has been the case. We all know of many where that has been the case, where a sense of urgency at the start creates a long-term problem. And as Peter said, what we're seeing, for instance, in Hub is a lot of price certainty being maintained. This is actually, and, and the affordability in the programme is very strong as a result of the decisions being made. And I think from that point of view, pace absolutely, getting things done absolutely, but we can't let ourselves be in a position where we hand the negotiating position to the private sector to go, well, we know you have a deadline to meet, mm -hmm. so we'll sit back until you concede all our points. We're not having that. OK, that's helpful. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. I mean, probably to pick up on just one or two points that have already uh, been mentioned. In your letter to John Swinney, which Gavin Brown was just talking about, uh, you talk about the, the figures which we have provided in Annex 1 are a projection of capital investment, not a budget. And then I think the word estimate came in somewhere as well. I think estimate might have been an alternative for projection. Could you just spell out for us how you see the difference between projection or estimate and budget? Um, I suppose a budget, the difference, the, a projection and an estimate, it, it largely is, yes, you're right, it's largely is two words, the same thing. We're looking forward, um, but you can do a projection based on a set of facts that, or you can do a projection based on um, people's estimates, if you see it, <laughs> maybe, not, maybe not making it, help me get clear. Um, looking into the future, if you've a set of commitments, you can say, actually, those commitments are going to cost X into the future, and that's a projection. If, however, you're projecting into the future where certain things still have to fall into place, that's a projection based on estimated figures. So do, if you, if you, if, does that help? 
Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Well, I have. <laughs> I'm not sure. Pe Peter's very good at explaining. Okay. The, the, the implication for us of something being a budget is all of the implications that you know well from the scrutiny of the Scottish Government's budget, which is that it is set on generally an annualised basis and you, the phrase that's, that's quite often applied is it's use it or lose it. And what we have here is a set of projects that, yes, we know have to be paid for in the future out of budgets set for um, revenue expenditure out of which the, the unitary charges for these projects will be met. And as I said earlier on, that budgetary implication of these projects starts once the project has been completed and is in use. So there's at least an 18-month construction period or even a three-year construction period for the larger projects between when we have absolute certainty on the cost when the contract is signed, because as we've said, the variation from that point under this route is extraordinarily small, and when the budget implication of the project occurs. And that annual profile of budget is very well known, very well understood, and can be put into the, um, the overall Scottish Government budget. So, Our, so would the, one of the differences be that budget is very much tied to time, time yeah. whereas projection, you're thinking just more the, the overall cost. So we're making a projection of the profile of when construction activity happens. Construction activity is in the long term paid for out of revenue budgets, but in, while it's happening, is simply a projection of when the activity on the site um, will, will take place, which is very important for the overall construction industry and the jobs that we've talked about, but isn't an annualised sum that comes out of a particular pot in a particular year. Okay, I think we'll leave that one at that <laughs> stage. Yep. Um, another thing that was mentioned, I think it was Mr McMahon, a talked about you know, the difference between a NPD and traditional borrowing and you made the point in your submission on, uh, to the Smith Commission that, the, you know, that you think there should be more flexibility. I mean, I was kind of under the assumption, rightly or wrongly, that all of these schemes, PPP, PFI, NPD, are only there because we can't use traditional borrowing. But, but would you actually be arguing that in some cases NPD is better than traditional borrowing, even if it was available? We're, as our chairman has said, we're ecumenical about what we do. We seek value for money, and there are countries around the world that have borrowing powers that still do project finance structures. So take Germany as an example, or France. Both of them um, you know, have borrowing powers as countries, but they choose for uh, autobahn improvements or for TGV enhancements to do it through uh, partnerships with the private sector. So there are different reasons why you do different things. So I think our starting point isn't an ideological one, not far from it. Ours is one of value for money. And, and it may be right at times to consider on a particularly risky project, are the private sector better placed to take that risk and, and um, pay that higher cost of, of finance? I think for us in Scotland, the main benefit we're getting from NPD is the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, taking that as an example, under capital budgets would not be built probably for five years or more. You know, so the availability of budgets would determine when it could be built. By bringing it forward in time uh, and getting the benefit of that now will help the Aberdeen economy. And the Aberdeen International Business Park, you know, one of its prime selling points where they've already built or in the process of building a third of a million square feet as a headquarters office, is actually, and, and, and the tenancy agreement for that now, is actually it's, it's hugely improved road links that are going to happen when AWPR is, is there. So we knew already that projects like the AWPR or the M8, even before they're finished, are starting to have an economic impact. So by being able to accelerate and bring those forward, now... But are you them forward? Because NPD effectively, as long as we can afford to repay it, is limitless. Whereas it, it, the only problem is that the capital borrowing is, is very limited. Is that, is that the problem? Yes. And, and the point we make in the Smith Commission is it would be better to have the choice. That, that, that's our point. It's, it's not that we're saying one's better than the other. I think one has a lower cost attached to it and is more flexible borrowing. I think the other brings in some private sector expertise and risk management that might be worth paying for in certain circumstances. So the point we're making in the Smith Commission submission is 
if we're paying for this one way or the other, why artificially restrict one? And that, that's, a point, that's a point we make. OK, that's helpful. Uh, the third one, we've already touched on this question about uh, mid-market rent or affordable rent. And then I think the phrase was also used, more affordable rent. And uh, you made the point that the, this was mainly in the East Coast, where presumably rents and housing costs are higher. I mean, can, can, you, can you just clarify for me a little bit as to where we're talking about with these rents when we use the t terms like these, affordable or mid-market mm -hmm. rent? Because there's no HAG involved, no grant, mm -hmm. so obviously you're having to cover all the costs. I mean, for example, you know, you might get up somewhere where a house, you could, if it was a social rented housing mm -hmm. with a housing association, you might only be paying a couple of hundred pounds rent in a month, and the, but if you went out in the private sector, it would be a thousand or something, so there can be quite big gaps in there. So where does this kind of housing fit in in that range? This fits at around 80% of market rent. So that's the sort of type of level we're talking about. And that, if, if you're sitting in a private rented home already with probably very little hope of getting a social rented home, is actually quite a significant saving. So the target market that National Housing Trust has largely serviced is people on and around, or working households, typically working households on and around median income. Um, it's available to, to all those sort of income groups, but that's the, the income group that's probably um, it's most popular with. And what that does actually is, quite often these are households where a large percentage of their take-home income in a month is going on property costs. So to save 20% on, on, on rent, plus to actually have the professional landlord service that gives you confidence that beyond the six-month tenancy agreement, you're likely to be able to stay there if you want to stay there, although you have the flexibility to leave, um, plus the energy saving costs, which can actually, the energy saving costs can quite often be a very big part of the benefit people get, because if you move from uh, an aging private rented home to a modern um, affordable rent home, um, the energy saving can be absolutely enormous for people. So you've painted as very attractive, and, and, and yet, if I'm, maybe I misunderstood what you were saying to Mr Hepburn, but um, it sounded like, you know, the kind of almost like the demand was falling for that, but I, I would imagine that what the picture you've painted, the demand would be increasing. The, the demand's increasing. It's the willingness of house builders to take, because they, they, need, they need to actually leave uh, an investment in this. That, so, you know, the, the partnership works on them maintaining an investment in, in, in the rental sector that's actually not their natural, that's not their natural way of doing business. They're, they're, most house builders are set up to build homes and sell them. Um, and I think during the hard times, they're willing to look at alternative models. Mm. Actually, right now, they, they're able to, be, to build and sell homes much more readily because mortgage availability has come back a bit. Mm -hmm. Things like help to buy have helped in terms of people getting into, all, all the ways of getting into the housing market. So I think from that point of view, um, it's not about us turning the tap off. It's not that at all. It's just that the opportunity to do it depended on market conditions. The market conditions have shifted. Therefore, we might not be able to do the same thing forever. So it's, it's, it's not... Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, we're operating in a market rather than in a grant-controlled decision-making process. Right, OK, that makes sense. Yep. So, mm -hmm. so in, sorry. Sorry. In that structure, as you said yourself, there's no HAG, so there's no grant as a form of funding for the unit. All of the long-term funding comes from the rental, the people that are paying. And what the NHT does is it combines together in the SFT's innovation is to bring the private developer equity along with local authority borrowing through PWLB along with the Scottish Government guarantee over elements of that borrowing. So if developers, as Barry said, want to deploy their equity elsewhere, they won't necessarily want to get involved. It's then our job to say there is still a demand for, for, for um, affordable housing. How can we continue to innovate with the tools at our disposal to allow that to be delivered um, within the sort of funding and financing arrangements that are available? What, what you said earlier about looking for a, a variation on. or something, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, my final point then... Um, on the, on the jobs that have been created, and I, I take the point you said already, this was a kind of formula rather than you couldn't list the actual people. I am just wondering, however, you know, where women fit into that and whether that would be 90% men getting these jobs, or do you have any idea of that? Um, I don't, as in 
I know the construction industry is still largely male dominated, and that's just you know I, I don't know the exact percentages, but mm -hmm. that's the reality of the of the industry. I'm not defending that, I'm not saying that, but I don't have the figures. I could try to find out if there's more industry figures available around that because I think um, it is an industry where we would like to see change, and a lot of people are undertaking a lot of initiatives to actually um, encourage more female workers to enter the I mean, is that something industry. that's discussed at any stage, that the contractor or the builder should be, well, well, presumably equal opportunities or these kind of things? The, the biggest thing we do to help improve skills and opportunity is around um, community benefit clauses and, community and key performance indicators and things like HUB. So actually what we are seeing, for instance, is in HUB 80% of the work flowing to small and medium enterprises, which I think, is, and that's where a lot of the training and development of, of, of uh, skilled workers actually takes place. We are an NPD programme uh, that, that Peter leads on. We've actually really pushed community benefits as far as we can, and, and we can give you some examples of the sort of community benefits in terms of graduates and apprenticeships that are flowing from that. The, in the construction procurement review, um, we've been asked to lead and how we can push that as far as possible going forward. And I think the point you've made about um, that balance of who works in the construction industry is something we should look at as part of that construction procurement review work. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, John. That's concluded questions uh, from uh, colleagues around the table. Just to ask one final question, and it's uh, in terms of the evidence we took this morning, uh, Professor John Kay suggested that the Scottish uh, Fiscal Commission should have a role in monitoring uh, future financial uh, obligations arising from NPD. Would you agree with that? Um, I think the transparency around whether or not the, the future liabilities in terms of whether the 5% cap that the government has set, which I think actually was a good thing to set, and how much we're committing in the future, I think monitoring the commitment we're making long term um, I think it's almost part of if you get extra borrowing powers, you want to go to the market to borrow. I think it's something you're going to have to be much more transparent about because I think if you want to issue bonds, for instance, uh, nationally, being transparent about your uh, liabilities, I think it's going to be an important part of that. So from a financial sense, I think going forward, um, those commitments, long-term commitments, um, will need, and I think we've actually, I believe, led the way by having this 5% cap, which was a government decision, not an SFT decision. Um, do you add anything to that, Peter? Yeah. For me, as, as Barry said, ability to repay is what constrains how much you got to borrow. So the whoever we decide has a role in both setting that and monitoring that will obviously take an interest in MPD payments as part of that overall picture. And it's important that they do so and important that they have the ability to to access easily completely transparent information on what those commitments are and part of our job is to at a program level be able to provide that information and aggregate it together across all the projects that, that we look over properly and, and we will continue to do that to support whichever bodies um, oversee that element of the economy going forward okay thank you any further points uh, you want to make before we wind up the session? Uh, just um, to thank um, the committee for the questions and, and to say, actually, we think what we have in Scotland and, and is viewed both by industry and by partners across Europe as a very active programme. So when we present, you know, this is something that um, financial institutions are very interested in. We've actually been able to attract great value finance. And I think having that pipeline out there and having the extension to the pipeline that's been announced has maintained that interest. The European Investment Bank are investing very heavily, and we're seeing people like Alliance Global Investors investing in the M8, bringing in pension fund money as part of that. So we're seeing a lot of international money, and while much discussion is taking place worldwide about how you get institutional money into infrastructure, we're just getting on and doing it in Scotland, and, and um, we're seeing some wonderful projects going ahead. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for answering all our questions. Uh, we agreed at last week's meeting that we would take the next item in private, so I now end uh, uh, this uh, public meeting um, and uh, close it to the official report also. We'll just have a couple.